Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace and blessings be upon each and every one of you. I begin today by paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land that we meet on, the Yagara and Turbu people, to their elders past and present. I'm Lutfia Osman, the president of Academy Alive. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming out on a Saturday afternoon to join us. And to those joining us online, welcome. Um, we've we're here today for the Jerusalem Story, an event that we put together um, to share the plight of the Palestinians, which is one that is very close to all of our hearts. The decades of oppression, settler forced expulsions, airstrikes, expulsions, blockades, detentions, and other aggressive measures amount to an alarming record of human rights violations. It is up to us as human beings to do everything we can to join the global effort to end support for Israel's oppression. We have a dynamic lineup of speakers today that I'm very excited about. They'll be taking us through the history uh, of Palestine, give us insight into the daily life of Palestinians today, and we even have a special guest to share the experience of living and studying in Jerusalem during the first Intifada. Um, to begin the program, we have a presentation on the history of Palestine by Dr. Zuhair Abdurrahman. Uh, he was born and raised in Toronto, Canada, studied the Islamic sciences under various local teachers. Currently, he works as a medical doctor here in Brisbane, and he also serves as a volunteer imam at a number of local mosques. He delivers lectures for adults and the youth. He has strong research interests in Islamic theology, Islamic spirituality, and mental health. And alongside his Islamic research, he has also published in medical journals and presented at psychiatric conferences. Thank you, Dr. Zuhair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu wa ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa habibina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahibi ajma'in ama ba'd. So welcome everyone uh, to this very special event, an event that's very close to my heart, an issue and a people uh, and a country that's also very close to my heart and the hearts of billions of Muslims all around the world. Uh, this program, uh, you might think, what is this in response to? And that's kind of the sad reality because oftentimes we only speak about Palestine when there is a flare, when there is an issue, when there is oppression that is acutely happening. Of course, it's always happening chronically uh, for almost a hundred years, subhanAllah, actually more than a hundred years really. And uh, I think it's important for us to take moments and times to remind ourselves of this part of the ummah. Because as the Prophet ﷺ said, the ummah is like a body. This is a very profound metaphor the Prophet ﷺ gave about this global community, what was to become a global community spanning from Indonesia, Malaysia, China, all the way to Al-Andalus, through North Africa, the Arab Arabian Peninsula, the Arab countries, of course, in the Middle East, and then the Persian countries and those in the Turkic and the Mongolic people. This global, and, and, and Africa, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, this global uh, ummah, all united upon this kalima of la ilaha illallah. And it's important for us to come together to remind ourselves of the suffering that many of our ummah are facing. So the program is going to be, inshallah ta'ala, a very enriching one, a very vibrant one, something that will be beneficial, educational, inspiring, uh, as well as something that will mobilize us to action. And that's really the point here. Uh, there are a few action points that we really want everyone to take from this event. Number one, of course, is to bring the Palestinian people to our conscience to continue to make du'a for them, to be able to uh, be involved in whatever initiative we may see around us to mobilize politically. Uh, number two as well, and this is going to be uh, my wife's portion, Amina, who's going to come and discuss uh, our recent travels to Palestine and to Jerusalem, and to really encourage everyone here to make it an effort, to make it a goal on themselves to go and travel to the Holy Land. Um, you know, a lot of people, they have the idea of going to Umrah, especially for coming from Australia. It's a long journey there. And one of our pleas that we'd submit to everyone here is to include Jerusalem in that journey. You're already all the way there in that part of the world. See if it can, if it can work practically, financially, etc., etc. 
So the fourth portion of this program is going to be largely educational. It's going to be a very ambitious historical project that we'll undertake from prophethood to the, the occupation. Uh, it will be a complete and comprehensive history, bidnilai ta'ala, of Jerusalem, an overview of things. And the reason why I think this is so important is because, you know, as they say, those who don't know history, they're just a leaf that, they, that is not know that they're actually part of a tree. The story of Jerusalem, this event is called the Jerusalem story. The story of Jerusalem is our story. You don't have to be Palestinian to understand or to be a part of that story. The story of Jerusalem is an Islamic story. It is a story of our faith. It is a story of our heritage. It's a story of our prophets. And it is ultimately a story that should mobilize us to care about this issue as if it is our own. And so, you know, there's that famous song about Anadam al-Filistini, right? That should be everyone. Everyone's blood should be Palestinian. Uh, and so, bear with me with this, and I need your attention, I need your focus, Bindahi Ta'ala, as we're going to go through this uh, history, this beautiful history of Palestine, Bindahi Ta'ala. Bismillah. Oh, and by the way, I should say as well, the third portion of the, uh, of the event, most important, and that's the one I'm most excited about, uh, where we have with us Dr. Muntasar Musameh, uh, all the way from Makai that's going to be joining with us. He has an incredible story and everything we're talking about here is going to come to life ta'ala, with his story. Okay, Bismillah, let us begin. So, we need to understand that Palestine and that area, in the Quran there are multiple verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it as a Mubarak land. And a very famous verse of course, the beginning of Surah Al-Isra. Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawlahu linuriyahu min ayatina innahu wa sami' al-basir Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references the very important event in the seerah of the Isra journey from Masjid al-Haram from Mecca to al-aqsa to Masjid al-aqsa look at the way Allah describes Masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawlahu the masjid of which we made blessed its surroundings. So subhanAllah, if the surroundings are blessed, can you imagine what the actual center is? And it shows us that the barakah of Al-Aqsa extends to that entire land of Palestine. And we know as well, uh, in another verse in Surah Al-A'raf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this, uh, uh, this, uh, this land uh, 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 الأرض, this land that was promised to the children of Israel during the time of Musa السلام, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it again fiha. it is a land in which we have put blessing in it and then we go on and we see another verse in Surah Al-Ma'idah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ref uh, references Musa السلام, saying Ya qawmi dukhulu al-arda al-muqaddasat allati katab Allahu lakum O oh, my people enter into the Ard al-Muqaddas. So we had Barakah in one hand, and now we have Muqaddas. Muqaddas is holy, sanctified. Allati katab Allahu lakum. That which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for you. Now, other virtues here, I'm not going to go through a long kind of, uh, you know, going through all the texts and ahadith that are mentioned. But of the other virtues that we learn about Masjid al-Aqsa, number one is that it is actually the second masjid that is built on the earth. And this is uh, from a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where he said that between the first masjid was Masjid al-Haram, which was Kaaba, and the second masjid was Masjid al-Aqsa. Uh, it of course is the land of the prophets. And so this is a place where the concentration of prophecy never occurred anywhere else in the world. Allah chose this area to send all those prophets from the line of Ya'qub alayhi salam, all of those prophets, Musa alayhi salam, his entire life's mission, now reflect on this, his entire life's mission was actually to get to Al-Aqsa, which he wasn't able to. And then after him with Yusha, and after him of course with Dawood alayhi salam, Sulaiman alayhi salam, and then you have Dhul uh, Yasa'a, and you have all these other reference prophets in the Quran, you have uh, al -Ayyub, you have Isa alayhi salam, you have all these prophets that are mentioned in the Quran, and of course the prophets that we see in the Old Testament, in the Bible as well, all centered around around that land. And these are prophets that we believe in, of course, as well. It is the place of Isra wal-Mi'raj. Subhanallah, 
where did Allah decide to ascend the Prophet ﷺ to that meeting with him when he went on that heavenly journey, the Mi'raj? He did it. Why did he go to Aqsa? He could have gone from the Haram. But no, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Al-Aqsa a very important part of the journey, the most incredible journey, one of the most incredible moments in the life of the Prophet Wasallam, the most transcendent, miraculous event in his life. He chose to send him to Al-Aqsa first. And of course, we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, think about this. You know, we talk about Masha Nabawi and Haram, we think the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prayed here. When you go to Aqsa, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also prayed there. And he led a congregation that is a congregational prayer that could not be matched before or after. Who were the congregants behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? The Prophets of Allah, SubhanAllah. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ made dua for its blessing. Allahumma barak lana fi shamina. O oh Allah, bless our sham. And sham, of course, included that region, that holy region, which is modern day Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, that area. That is the sham area that the Prophet ﷺ made dua. And look, he said, fi shamina, our sham. This was during the time of the Prophet ﷺ. This was not in the land of the Muslims. Which shows us that this is a theological point for us, that this is a part of who we are. The Arabs that he was speaking to, they were not from Sham. But he was saying, Fi Shamina, that this is our Sham. And of the last points I want to mention is the Prophet ﷺ. His last command as a Prophet of Allah ﷺ before he left this world was for Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu an to lead an army in the direction of Sham. And of course it was understood that this army was meant to get to Al-Aqsa and liberate Jerusalem for the Muslims. That was the last command of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is something that is so significant and such an important aspect of our deen. Now, uh, what is Mashal Aqsa? I'm not going to spend too much time on this because my wife will be going into detail about this. So I don't want to spoil many of the things there. Uh, but Mashr al-Aqsa, just in brief, is that entire complex there with the Dome of the Rock, which is close to the center. Actually, as you see, the Dome of the Chain to the right of it, with the little blue dome, that is actually the center point of the entire Aqsa complex. But that entire part of Mashr al-Aqsa, it's not just the Green Dome, and it's not just Mashr al-Qibli uh, in front of it. It's the entire area that is Mashr al-Aqsa. Uh, we'll just skip through these slides inshallah uh, about all the Dome of the Rock and these sorts of things and get to the aspect of where the story begins. Okay, so let's start this story. The Prophet wasallam said in a hadith narrated through Abu Dhar uh, al-Gifari uh, radiallahu an, uh, and it's a hadith in Sahih Muslim. I asked the Messenger of Allah wasallam, what was the first masjid built on the earth? Ya Rasulullah, أي مسجد وضع في الأرض أولا قال المسجد الحرام he said it is مسجد الحرام the كعبة قال قلت ثم أي then which one قال المسجد الأقصى he said مسجد الأقصى قلت then I said كم كان بينهما how much was it between them between مسجد الحرام and the building of مسجد الأقصى قال أربعون سنة he said forty years and so here we get history from the Prophet ﷺ. Now the scholars differ who built the Kaaba and who built Al-Aqsa first. And so some of the ulama, they say it was Adam السلام, the first human being, and some say it was Ibrahim السلام. Now, we move on and we see that when we look at our early history into that area of Palestine and Jerusalem, it was inhabited and it was called Canaan or Canaan. Uh, this was the um, uh, name that is the biblical name that is given, and it was named Jerusalem. Uh, and so, this term Jerusalem actually, they, it actually comes from a god that they used to worship because the Canaanites they were polytheists at the time. Um, and so, Shalim, uh, which obviously is very similar to the Arabic Salam, uh, was their god of peace and security. So it was called Jerus Shalim, Jerusalem. Now, the Canaanites, in that area of Palestine. That was a name that described a collective group of multiple indigenous people that were living in that area. And it was a land uh, that was desert, 
But for some reason, you could grow these olive trees and it was fertile soil for farmers as well. This is Allah SWT says, we've made barakah in this land. The ulama say, part of the barakah is the dunyawi barakah. The barakah in the farming, the barakah in the olives, the barakah in the fruits. Now, that's Canaan at this point in time. That's Palestine. It's inhabited by polytheists and those are the people that are there. Now, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam is born where? Where is Ibrahim alayhi salam born? Where was he originally from? In Ur, in ancient Babylon, in, mo in modern day Iraq, that's where Ibrahim alayhi salam was. Now, we know the story, I'm not going to go through the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam, but long story short, he preaches a message his people doesn't like, he even has an audience with the king, and they try to catapult him into a pit of fire. Then he does hijra fi sabilillah, and this is referenced in the Quran. Lut. So Lut was the only one who believed with him, and he was from his family. And he said that I am going to do hijra to my Lord. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references where he does hijrah to as a gift to Ibrahim alayhi salam. وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ وَلُوطًا إِلَى الْأَرْضِ الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا لِلْعَالَمِينَ You see again, this is another reference to the land and Allah describes it as a blessed land. So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he has this concept and this notion of tawheed and monotheism. He's inspired by Allah azza wa jal. He has the suhuf of Ibrahim alayhi salam. He has some revelation as well. In that time, in that earth, there was no place on the earth where he could freely worship Allah and live his life in this particular way and be able to pass on this deen to his descendants. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised Ibrahim alayhi salam a land that was known as the blessed land and that was Palestine. So Ibrahim alayhi salam and Lut alayhi salam, they go to that region and they are settling there and Allah has promised that this will be a place. And in the Bible it references this covenant. A covenant is made with Ibrahim alayhi salam through both of his sons. He has two sons. What are his two sons? Quickly. Come on guys, this is Sunday school, basic stuff. Two sons of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Come on guys. Thank you, Jazakum khairan. Ismail and Ishaq. Very good. These are the two sons of Ibrahim alayhi salam. You see in the Bible, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is said that Allah makes a covenant with Ibrahim alayhi salam and says, you will be a great nation. And Allah says this in the Quran, that inni ja'iluka lin nasi imama. I'm going to make you an imam over the people. You will be this, as he's known now, as the father of Tawheed, the father of monotheism. And he makes a covenant with Ishaq and says, through Ishaq, I will make a great nation. A nation that is centered around la ilaha illallah, worshiping Allah alone. And he says the same thing about Ismail alayhi salam. He says the same thing about Ismail alayhi salam. So Ib Ibrahim is given this divine promise. And before this, if you notice, the Prophet's stories before Ibrahim alayhi salam, the Prophets are sent to a people that disbelieve and the place is destroyed. And then the story ends for them. They don't go and establish afterwards. We don't know what happens after them. It seems that they then die out and their message dies out eventually. This is a shift in the historical reality of the Prophets. Because now Ibrahim salam is giving a message. Yes, we've saved you from your people, but now you're going to have a civilization, a nation based on Tawheed, which didn't happen, that we have at least from the Quran, from the Sunnah, didn't happen before Ibrahim salam. So this is something new. It's like the earth is being ready now for Tawheed and the Deen of Islam to take on this new light now. So both of his sons are promised this. One son is, goes where? Uh, Ismail goes where? Where does Ismail go? Very good. Jazakum khairan. Mecca. Right? He goes to Mecca. That's the whole story of the Kaaba. And Ishaq is in Palestine. He's in Palestine to Sarah, his wife. And then Hajar was with Ismail. And so you have these two children that Allah has now promised great nations from both of them. So let's now focus on Ishaq's line, because this is what's relevant to Palestine. So, Ishaq gives birth to who? Who is the Prophet that is the son of Ishaq? Jazakum khairan. What's your name, brother? Zakaria, you're killing it, mashallah, tabarakallah. Very fitting name as well, alhamdulillah, as we're talking about Palestine. Zakaria is one of the Prophets from Al Aqsa. So, Zakaria, Jazakum khairan. So, Ya'qub is the son of Ishaq. So, you have Ibrahim to Ishaq to Ya'qub. Now, 
the story of Yaqub, who is the son of Yaqub alayhi salam? Yusuf, right? We all know that one, Yusuf. Now the story of Yusuf, so Yaqub is living with his family in Palestine, right? He's with the, Canaan, the Canaanites and, and whatnot that are there. It's under Egyptian rule politically. It's under Egyptian rule politically. At this point in time, Aqsa is built. Because either it was from Adam or Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Aqsa is built, whatever in whatever structure, we don't know how it looks, but there's a masjid there and they are praying there. And this is the Abrahamic faiths and where they started, this small little family that's there in Palestine. And it's under Egyptian rule. And Yaqub alayhi salam gives birth, uh, sorry, Yaqub alayhi salam's son is uh, Yusuf alayhi salam. And we know the story, Yusuf goes to Egypt and then eventually takes the whole family to Egypt because there's a big famine. And so the family of Yaqub, what's another name for Yaqub by the way? What's the other name? Israel. So Yaqub's name is Israel. That's another name for Yaqub. So when we say Bani Israel, who is the Bani Israel? The children of Yaqub alayhi salam. So the Bani Israel are in Egypt. Now, all the way until Musa alayhi salam's time. The Bani Israel are there in Egypt. Now they're not Egyptians at all, are they? These are people who came from Ur in Iraq and they settled in you know, Palestine. They're not Egyptians. So what happens when you have a minority of people in a dominant society? You get xenophobia, discrimination, prejudice, all these things. So what happens to the Bani Israel? They become enslaved. They become marginalized. As the Quran describes, a great test and trial to the children of Israel that, you know, they would kill the uh, children, they'd kill the boys, they'd leave the women, they enslaved that entire uh, tribe. Now, enter Musa alayhi salam. So from Yusuf alayhi salam all the way to Musa alayhi salam, they're all in Egypt. Musa alayhi salam is born. Now Musa alayhi salam receives these revelations and he's now saying, and you can imagine these are people that forgot their history. He's now saying, we come from Ibrahim alayhi salam. This was the promise given to Ishaq. This was the promise given to Yaqub. The Bani Israel, Allah promised us to be a great nation. And I'm the one that's going to save us from, you know, the, uh, from Fir'aun and take us to the promised land. That was the mission of Musa alayhi salam. And establish the kingdom of Allah on earth. And that's why Musa alayhi salam was given laws. He was given laws, he was given a sharia. He was given an ability then for people to then govern themselves. He was given a full set of laws that are captured that we can see now in the Talmud and in the Tanakh and, and the Old Testament and whatnot, you can see some of these laws that are there from Musa alayhi salam. So Musa alayhi salam we know goes and he takes the children of Israel away and his life's mission is to get to back to Palestine, to the promised land. And that's the land that Allah has promised them. But of course, they have the Amalekites that are there, they have the, um, uh, they have very strong tyrannical rulers that are there. Jabbarin, as Allah describes them in the Quran, very strong, you know, compelling tyrants. And so obviously we know the stories, many of the Bani Israel, they become haughty, they, you know, they reject or they don't participate and these sort of things. You and your Lord go and, and, and fight. We'll just sit here, these sort of sarcastic types of things. And this is found in the biblical narrative. This is not just in the Quran, this is their own scriptures and they understand this about their own history. And of course, because of this, Musa salam, never reaches Al-Aqsa. It was his entire life's dream and vision to get to Aqsa and to establish this promise that Allah had promised the people of Tawheed, the people of La ilaha illallah. And he was not able to do it. And when the angel of death came, eventually he asked to be put in a place where he could at least see it. So he's buried somewhere where he can at least see Al-Aqsa. Now just a side point here, imagine this. Subhanallah, that was his entire life struggle. For us, just one flight away. Just one flight away. And subhanallah, you can go to the place that Musa spent his entire life searching after. A very humbling thought. Now, we move on. And after Musa alayhi salam, Yusha, Joshua, is the next in command. And eventually they're able to invade and make their way into Palestine. And eventually, to cut a long story short, you have the kingdom of Dawood alayhi salam. So basically after Yusha, then you have Talut or Saul. And then under Saul, you had Dawood alayhi salam, who's the one who then slays al Jalut, the Goliath. And this is actually referenced in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah. This battle is referenced. And the fact that the Muslims were small and they were large in number. Uh, the Bani Israel were small and they were large in number. And then Dawood alayhi salam uh, defeats the, the Goliath and establishes the kingdom. He becomes the king. 
and he then gives the son, his son, the kingdom, which is Sulaiman alayhi salam. And this is where you have a magnificent building of Mashal Aqsa. So Mashal Aqsa is now built by Sulaiman alayhi salam. And that is that area. The Jews call it the Temple Mount or the Temple of Solomon. That's what they call it, the Temple of Solomon. Obviously, we understand Masjid, I mean, it's the same thing, right? A place of worship. So the Temple of Solomon and the Mashal Aqsa, these are the same thing. So Sulaiman alayhi salam builds, um, further develops Baytul Maqdis, I should say. Dawud alayhi salam is the one who builds it. Now, when you look at the Temple of Solomon, its description in the Bible, it's something of great majesty. The Quran also references this as well about Sulaiman alayhi salam in Surah Sabah. He describes, uh, you know, the miracles that were given to Sulaiman alayhi salam and the elevated chambers and the statues and the bowls, like reservoirs and, and kettles and all these things. Like the way the Quran describes the time of Sulaiman alayhi salam, it's like. It's like Jannah on earth. It's like, this is the dream. This is the fulfillment of that promise that Allah gave to Ibrahim through Ishaq. This is the great nation that came forward. This nation of Tawheed, this nation of La ilaha illallah. You have Sulaiman alayhi salam with this masjid, so beautiful, so magnificent. These are the glory days. Now, beautiful narration I want to highlight here. Uh, it was narrated from Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when Sulaiman ibn Dawood finished during uh, building the Bayt al-Maqdis, he asked Allah for three things. Number one, judgment that was in harmony with his judgment. Number two, a dominion or a mulk that no other, uh, no other one other than him will have. And number three, that no one should come to his masjid intending only salah there, but he will emerge free of sin as the day his mother bore him. SubhanAllah. This is also the reward of Hajj. And the Prophet ﷺ said the two prayers were granted and I hope the third one was also granted. So that is Mashid al-Aqsa. Now, Mashid al-Aqsa is there during the time of Sulaiman salam. Now what happens? As we know, and this is in the biblical scriptures and the Quran, the children of Israel, they start to deviate. Some of them start to go to idol worship. You have Ilyas, for example, alayhi salam, who's preaching to their people because they're starting to go to Baal, which was one of the ancient Canaanite gods and these sorts of things. And so there's lots of mess that's happening there. Prophets are sent to try and bring them back to Tawheed. They reject some of them. They kill some of them. And all these things are happening. So then Allah says, and this is actually in Surah Al-Isra, وَقَضَيْنَا إِلَىٰ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ فِي الْكِتَابِ لَتُفْسِدُنَّ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَرَّتَيْنِ وَلَتَعْلُنَّ عُلُوًا كَبِيرًا We have decreed that the Bani Israel, they will commit corruption on the land twice. Twice. And then Allah says, فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعَدُ أُولَاهُمَا بَعَثْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ عِبَادٍ لَنَا أُولِي بَأْسٍ شَدِيدٍ فَجَاسُوا خِلَالَ الدِّيَارِ very interesting. The Quran references the Babylonian massacre. He said, when the first time came, you were given this land, you were given all this, the kingdom of David, Sulaiman alayhi salam, then you deviated, you spread the corruption in the land. Then Allah says, we sent our servants, and is referencing the Babylonians. And they destroyed you, and that's what happened. The Babylonians came, and they destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the, uh, the, the buildings of the They destroyed Mashr al-Aqsa. So they destroyed the Temple of Solomon as well. And they enslaved them and they exiled many of them. And so you have the first Jewish diaspora when the Babylonians came. This is 586 BCE. This is before the uh, Christian era. This is uh, 586 years before Isa alayhi salam comes. Now, that's happening. So now there's no much of Aqsa. They're all in this particular way. Now the Quran says, and this is the traditional interpretation, then we return, gave you victory over them. So what happens? A Persian, Cyrus the Great comes and conquers the land and he was a lot more pluralistic and a lot more open to the Jewish people. And so then he freed the Jews from the Babylonian captivity and he allowed and even financed the rebuilding of the temple. So now this is the second temple of Sulaiman. Now I want you to keep this in mind because that's going to be significant when we talk about the Western Wall. So we have two temples of Solomon. This is the second one built during the time of Cyrus the Great. Now, the second temple of Solomon obviously is not as magnificent because it's not as miraculous and there was not the miracles that were given to um, Sulaiman alayhi salam. And so then we get to the Roman rule and the Quran references this. 
إن أحسنتم أحسنتم فلا لأنفسكم وإن سأتم فلها فإذا جاء وعد الآخرة ليسوء وجوهكم. So now the second time. So now they spread corruption. Then these people came. Then Allah said, "We return the favor to you during the time of Cyrus." And then after Cyrus, the Romans ruled. And then they tried to rebel and were treacherous against the Romans. So now the second one. So the Romans came and then they destroyed the second temple. They destroyed the second temple of Solomon. Now there is a wall that is there that is meant sent to be the remnant of that wall from the uh, second temple. And that's what they call the wailing wall. They say that this was from that particular time, from the destruction of the second temple. This happened 66 CE. This happened 66 CE. So this is after Isa alayhi salam. This is after Isa alayhi salam, where the Romans then destroyed the second temple. Now, Isa alayhi salam's story is very interesting and very significant here. And we're going to have an event, inshallah, here on the 24th of December. Uh, considering that that's the season that many people here are thinking about Isa alayhi salam to talk about the true Isa alayhi salam story because a lot of Muslims are unaware they just think oh yeah miraculous birth etc etc prophet of Allah but what is his role in our greater narrative and our understanding so Isa alayhi salam comes as a prophet now he's coming 0 CE so this is during the Roman rule he comes during the Roman rule and now he's preaching and actually all the prophets are preaching of a promise of a Messiah that's going to come to reinstate the kingdom of David. There's going to be a Messiah that's going to come to bring back the way, the glory days, like in the Dawud Islam's time. That is what the people in the Jewish tradition are thinking and that's what the prophecies say in the book and that's what they're waiting for. They're waiting for that Messianic figure that's going to come and bring back the kingdom of Dawud Islam, or the kingdom of Allah, or the kingdom of heaven as they call it. So Isa Islam is that Messiah. As we even uh, 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 attest to, he is Al Masih, he is the Messiah. Isa is the promised Messiah. He comes to the people and he preaches the Tawheed, he preaches them back to the scriptures, to the law of Musa, السلام, made some things easy as well. And Isa السلام's message was actually one of then, if he's the Messiah, that means he is going to lead a revolution against the Romans. And so you have his disciples, his Hawariyun, who decide to support him in this, and the Jews reject him. They're living comfortable lives, especially the high priests. They're in their government paid positions. They're happy there. They don't want to go and have to fight and take on the entire superpower of the Roman army. So they reject him and they tell the Romans he's claiming to be the king of the Jews, which is treason. And so that's why the punishment for treason is crucifixion under Roman law. And he's, they're telling the Jews, this guy's claiming to be the son of God, which is of course blasphemous in the Jewish tradition and is polytheism and would be also punishable by death as well. So they're telling two different stories to different people. And this is in the Bible as well. And so they reject Isa alayhi salam. Uh, and so Isa alayhi salam, we believe he's going to come back in the end of time. And the promise is the Messiah is not for the Jewish people specifically, but for the entire world, the kingdom of Allah and the kingdom of heaven for the entire globe in which there will be world peace united under uh, the leadership of Isa uh, alayhi salam. Uh, so that's the story of Isa alayhi salam in a nutshell in this relation here. Now, back to history. So he obviously leaves the scene and Allah saves him. And so now the Jewish people are there. The Romans are still there. I mean, subhanAllah, it's incredible when you think about it. It's like 60 years later, they decide, let's now revolt against the Roman people. I'm like, subhanAllah, just 60 years ago, you could have had a prophet of Allah on your side. Now 60 years after you decide. And of course, the Romans, then they get upset and they decimate them. They destroy them. And... Uh, they destroy as we spoke about the second temple. So up until uh, the time of the Prophet وسلم, the Romans are in control of that region. And the Romans, they turn that second temple into literally a garbage dump. Literally a garbage dump. It is the landfill of that region. Why? Because they had a lot of animosity to the Jewish people as being treacherous, as constantly allying with the Persians against them because the Persians are always a lot more nicer to the Jewish people. And so the Romans, as an act of kind of this, whatever, they destroyed the temple and turned it into a garbage dump. Now, as we go later, and this is referenced in the Quran as well, it's in the history of the Quran, Rum fi adna al-ard, that the Romans have been defeated close to the Dead Sea area, so that's where Palestine is. And 
And then it said after a few years, the Romans will come back. This is one of the predictions of the Quran or the miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu that he predicted the reconquering of that land from the Romans. Uh, and the Persians actually received help and support from the Jews. Uh, and so after that as well, they turned it into that, you know, they continued to persecute them in that regard. And they had very bad relations with the Jewish people. Um, now, then we have Isra al-Mi'raj. We won't go into that because uh, we spoke about that. Um, and then we have the Byzantine reconquering, as we said. And now we have the Qibla. So during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and the message of the Prophet Sallallahu Now remember I said, Allah gave a promise to Ibrahim salam that he'd make a great nation through Ishaq, but also through Ismail. So Ismail is born in Mecca. He's born in Mecca. Sorry, Ismail, Ismail is not, sorry. Ismail is in Mecca. And his descendants are there in Arabia. And so the Prophet that comes out of Arabia is the Prophet Sallallahu So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the fulfillment of that promise to Ibrahim through his son Ismail. And the great nation that comes forth from Ismail is actually a nation that will unite all of the Abrahamic children. Because the Muslim faith is not something specifically for the Arabs, but it is for everyone. And so the, the kingdom of God or the nation is now a global nation and not just specifically for the Bani Israel. And so the Prophet ﷺ comes and he's preaching Tawheed and the Quran and this revelation is coming and affirming this prophetic story that we just went through. That there's a story of Tawheed on this earth and that the story has now gone through Ibrahim salam. And we have all these prophets that have been mentioned in the Quran of trying to get to this civilization of faith. And so the Prophet ﷺ says that he is the last and final messenger. And he's, this is what is revealed to him. That his deen that's going to come forward is a deen that is a reinvigoration, a renewal of the original deen that was sent to all the Prophets. And that this is going to be for all of the people of the book and for the people of all of the worlds. And so the first Qibla for the Muslims, of course, as we all know, was to Mashr al-Aqsa. Because that is the tradition that we come from. We come from this prophetic tradition, from this Abrahamic tradition. And as we said and referenced before, during the time of the Prophet of course the Qibla changes to uh, the Kaaba. And um, then as the you know, time goes on, uh, the Prophet he commands Usama ibn Zayd an, to go and open Bilad al-Sham. This command is fulfilled through the Khilafah of who's after the Prophet who's in Jazakumul Khair and Zakaria, Abu Bakr radiallahu an. And during the end of his reign, that is really right where the Muslims are able to conquer Jerusalem. And so they request Umar radiallahu an, because he now is the next Khalifa, to be the one to come and to take the keys of Jerusalem. So Umar radiallahu an, he comes and subhanallah, the humility of which he comes. And this is a point for us to understand, because this is the start of the Muslim aspect of uh, of Jerusalem. What is our beginning? What is our origin story in this place? Subhanallah, look at the humility and look at the purity. Umar radiallahu an, a companion of the Prophet sallallahu he comes forward dragging his own camel by the rain and his sandals are on his shoulder. And his garment was patched because Umar radiallahu didn't want to waste money and the, and the ummah's money, you know, buying nice clothes and these sorts of things. And so he would just patch his clothes. A patched garment. And it is said that he went through like a muddy area as well. Mud all over. And so he comes, that's how he's coming now to Jerusalem to receive the keys. And Abu Bayyid ibn al-Jarrah said, you know, you're going to be people, why are you coming like this, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen? And Umar radiallahu responded, inna kunna dhil al-qawm fa'azzan Allah bil-Islam. These are golden words that echo throughout history. And he said, and if we, so we were a despised people and we gained our izzah and honor and power through Islam. And if we try to seek izzah through other than that, then we will be humiliated once again. These strong words from Umar and a demonstration of that, of who we are is our character, is our deen, is our belief, is our akhlaq, is our code, is our Islam. And that is what the source of our power will be. And so Umar al comes in this way and he has a servant that came with him that's actually now riding on as he's dragging it because he wanted to be fair. And so when they were entering Jerusalem, it happened to be the servant's turn. And so then he said, no, you have to go on it. And they went through like that. A very inspiring way Umar took Jerusalem. 
And then Umar made a agreement with everyone that was there. Uh, and so I'll read a little bit of it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is the assurance of safety which the servant of Allah, Umar, the commander of the faithful, has given to the people. He has given them an assurance of safety for themselves, for their property, their churches, their crosses, the sick and the healthy of the city, and for all the rituals which belong to their religion. The churches will not be inhabited by Muslims and will not be destroyed. And, and it goes on and so on and so forth. And then there's something called the Shurutul Amariya or the Pact of Umar. And they had an agreement of how all faiths could coexist and practice their religion uh, in Jerusalem under Muslim rule. Now, Umar's story when he comes in is so beautiful. So, is there a Mashal Aqsa when Umar comes? What is the Mashal Aqsa when Umar comes? What is it now? What did we say it was? So, Umar comes now. What was it? Yes, a garbage dump, right? It was a garbage dump. So Umar comes and he comes to Aqsa and he finds this garbage and this filth. So he himself and he ordered the other companions with him to clean it. He literally cleaned Al-Aqsa with his own hands and the companions as well. And then they said, where are we going to build this masjid? Where are we going to build a musalla? Because the whole thing is the masjid. Where are we going to build the structure? And so uh, one of the uh, Jewish converts, Ka'ab al-Ahbar, he said, we should build it here. And he's referencing the rock, which is the Temple Mount, uh, the, the, the height of the Temple Mount according to the Jews. And according to the Jews, that's the holiest of holies. That's where the presence of Allah was and these sorts of things. So he said, we should build the masjid there. And Umar said, no, that's for the Jewish people. We will build it in front of that, with that behind us. So then you have, and we're going to get to that uh, in the next session, inshallah, Masjid al-Qibli is in front of the Dome of the Rock. And so you're facing the Qibla and your back is towards the Dome of the Rock that's before. And so he makes the small musalla there, uh, where is now Jam al Qibali, and they all pray there. Um, now, um, with regards to the, um, uh, the, the Holy Sepulchre Church, the Holy Sepulchre Church is a church that it is said to be, the most Christians believe, where Isa alayhi salam was crucified, and where Isa alayhi salam actually, um, where he. Um, uh, you know, was washed and these sorts of things, which we don't believe as well, and where he's resurrected. So a very holy place. So they actually invited Umar, come pray here, as a sign of honor and sharaf. And Umar said, I will not pray here, because if I pray here, then my followers will turn this into a masjid. And so he went and he prayed somewhere else, because the time of Asr came. And so he went and prayed, just literally a cross. And what happened? They turned it into a masjid. And so to this day, you see Masjid al-Umar, right next to the Holy Sepulchre Church. And that's a beautiful, lasting legacy of Umar radiallahu anhu. Okay, let's move forward now. So I'm going to go just briefly through these. So after the Khulafa Rashidun, you have the Umayyad dynasty. Now the Umayyad dynasty, uh, they build the Dome of the Rock. Because until this time, it's just the Masjid al-Qibli. They, they build that beautiful dome structure that you see, the golden dome with the, uh, you know, the blue and everything like that. That was built by the Umayyads. And just in the interest of time, we'll go forward. But there's nothing significant about that rock. Some say that's where the Prophet ﷺ ascended. There's no evidence to suggest that. Then the Abbasid comes in, multiple renovations, adding pillars. They're just basically renovating the area of Mashhad al-Aqsa. Now we get into the Crusaders. So, the Fatimids. The Fatimids, they are an Ismaili dynasty. They claim to be the Khilafah as well. So they are a branch from the Shi'i. Uh, uh, Muslims. And so the Fatimids, which are Ismaili branching from that, they have control over North Africa and eventually they defeat the Seljuks that were there under the Abbasids and they take control of that region of Palestine. And they actually destroy the Holy Sepulchre Church, the one that Umar wanted to preserve, and they destroy it to the ground. And obviously, what's this going to do in Europe? Fire up sentiments and these sorts of things. The Seljuks retake it. And they're also harassing Christian pilgrims and these sorts of things. Uh, and so now, this sentiment of the crusade starts to build from this. And so Pope Urban II in 1095 declares the first crusade. And they lay siege to Fatima, Jerusalem at the time. And they enter it and it was the bloodiest massacre ever recorded in human history. It is said that the blood was literally to the knees of the people. Uh, and uh, they destroyed... Uh, much of uh, you know, the, the, the synagogues that were there. And even in Masjid al-Aqsa, they turned it basically into a place for their horse stables and bathrooms and toilets and all these different things. 
Um, and there's just numbers there. You can see uh, 10,000 people were killed at the masjid, 70,000 inhabitants in total, according to Ibn Athir uh, and other historians as well. Uh, and these Templar knights that are coming from Europe, they're coming and they are uh, taking siege, uh, they're, they're taking control of the city. And they turned the Dome of the Rock into a church as well. Um, now, for almost 100 years, the Crusaders are there and the Muslims are not able to get it back. Then we get to the story of Salahuddin al-Ayubi, a very famous figure, reviver of uh, the land of uh, Palestine. Salahuddin al-Ayubi was an Arab, he was a Kurdish uh, general. And essentially, what Sul uh, Salahuddin did, again in the interest of time, he unified the Muslim Ummah that was surrounding the Crusaders. Because before, at his time, by that time, the Ummah was very disunited, kind of like what we are now. And so the first step for Salahuddin was to unite everyone under the Ayyubid dynasty. Then he went and uh, proceeded to, uh, the, um, uh, to the borders of Jerusalem. And in the Battle of Hattin, in the Battle of Hattin in 1187, Salahuddin fights the largest forces of the Crusaders and he delivers a decisive victory. Then they lay siege to Jerusalem. And then he conquers just as Umar conquered without bloodshed and actually allowing for Christians to stay and to keep the places of worship. No pillaging and all these things. And this is the piety of Salahuddin al-Ayubi. Uh, and the problem was, as we saw, those other rulers like the Fatimids and whatnot, they lost the spirit of that sunnah, of understanding, of coexisting. But now Salahuddin comes from that religious spirit, and so he brings forth that prophetic attitude that Umar also embodied, and now Salahuddin uh, bodied. So Jerusalem is liberated, and he repairs the mosques, and he uh, uh, reinstates it. Now, subhanAllah, Salahuddin al-Ayyubi's mimbar uh, is there, he, and it was still there up until 1969 actually. So Hadid's original mimbar, in which he would give the khutbas. It was a beautiful, you know, uh, car, hand carved, uh, uh, you know, structure. It was actually an Australian evangelical Christian who went there and burnt it in 1969. And actually he was charged and whatnot, brought back to Australia and they let him go off of like mental health things. <laughs> Some things never change, huh? In 1969 that happened, but a replica that was built before, it was put in its state. So now you go to Aqsa and you see it, a complete replica of the original uh, member of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi. And the member of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, that is where to this day the Imam stands and delivers the khutbah from the place of Salahuddin. And the mihrab that is there is the mihrab of Salahuddin. And you actually see the inscription that's there, the original inscription from Salahuddin saying and declaring that this is free from the Crusaders and this is for the Muslims and reminding the Muslims to make sure that they always stand on guard and stay true to their principles. And he actually kept some of the Crusader um, you know, structures that were there to remind the Muslims of what happens when you slack. And subhanAllah, you can still see them there to this day. This is from, you know, you, they'll point it out, this is from the Crusaders actually. This is what Hadin actually kept as a reminder for the Muslims. Now, we come to the Ottomans. Um, and so the Ottomans rule from 1517 to 1917 over the area. And they add some things and whatnot to the Masjid. Okay, now we get to Zionism. 1896. So 1896. So subhanAllah, Umar al-Duhan conquered in the 600s, 1896. This is more than 1,200 years at this point in time of it being under continuous Muslim land except for a small period of less than 100 years with the Crusaders. Theodore Herzl, this man here, comes up with this idea in 1896 of the Jewish state, stating a solution to anti-Semitism. And now where is this anti-Semitism being felt? In Europe. This anti-Semitism was in Europe. And remember we were speaking about how the Romans treated the Jews? A lot of that goes historically back to that conflict that was there. So this anti-Semitism that was inherited from the Romans to the European people, there he's now thinking, what's the solution to this? So he comes up with this idea of the Jewish state. That is what Zionism is called. It's the political idea that the Jews should have a political homeland for themselves. And the propaganda was to convince European Jews that this home should be in Palestine. And the slogan that they made popular was, a country without a people for a people without a country. So they're claiming Palestine is a country without a people. That's the propaganda that they're giving to the people. And the World Zionist Organization is convened with their first Congress in 1897. 
Now, during the time that this is now being discussed, who's in control of Jerusalem? The Ottomans. Jazakum khairan. So now the Zionists, the first plot is, let's buy them out. Make it easy and simple. The Ottomans are in decline. The Ottomans are becoming the sick men of Europe. The Ottomans are becoming, you know, very much weak and in decay. And so let's just buy them out. They're going to want the money, etc., etc. Um, so in this period of time, by the way, they transported 35,000 Jews from Europe to Palestine, Ottoman-controlled Palestine. And they would go into different areas and farms, areas that were not as much inhabited. And the early settlements were focused around four cities, Jerusalem, Hebron, Safed, and Tiberias. Uh, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, during this time where the Zionist movement starts, he was very distrustful of this movement. Because at this moment, they're saying, look, we're just bringing them here, they can live here in peace and whatnot. But Sultan Abdul Hamid II, he had the foresight to understand, no, they're going to want to take over this entire land. Which, of course, subhanAllah, he was correct. Now, how are the European Jews responding to this idea of Zionism initially? Well, not everyone was sold on the idea. So here is a quote from a truth from Ertz Yisrael. So they called it Ertz Yisrael, Ard al-Israel in Arabic, right? The Israeli earth. So Ahad Ha'am or Asher Ginsburg, who was a proponent of cultural Zionism, not political Zionism, criticized how the Jewish settlers were behaving in Palestine when they came under the Ottomans. Look what he says here. We abroad are used to believing that Erz Israel is now almost totally desolate, a desert that is not sowed, and that anyone who wishes to purchase land there may come and purchase as much as he desires. But in truth, that is not the case. Throughout the country, it is difficult to find fields that are not sowed, only sand dunes and stony mountains that are not fit to grow anything but fruit trees. And this only after hard labor and great expense of clearing and reclamation. Only these are not cultivated. So he's saying, number one, this propaganda that this is a place that nobody's there is incorrect. The second thing he says, the Zionists treat the Arabs, he's referring to the Palestinians, with hostility and cruelty. This is in the late 1800s. Deprive them of their rights, offend them without cause, and even boast about their deeds. This is late 1800s. The Jewish settlers regarded all Arabs as savages of the desert, a people similar to a donkey. This is an insider. This is a person that went to Israel in this Zionist project and saw what he saw in the late 1800s. This is his testimony. And in his book, Wrestling with Zion, he says, do not provoke the anger of the native people. Who are the native people? The Palestinians, by doing them wrong. We should be cautious in our dealings with a foreign people among whom we return to live, to handle these people with love and respect. Needless to say, with justice and good judgment. And what do our brothers do? Exactly the opposite. They were slaves in the diasporas, and suddenly they find themselves with unlimited freedom, wild freedom, that only a country like Turkey, referring to the Ottoman Empire, can offer, subhanAllah. He's saying, look at how much better life is when we left Europe and we came to Ottoman lands. This sudden change has planted despotic tendencies in their hearts, as always happens to former slaves. They deal with the Arabs with hostility and cruelty, trespass unjustly, beat them sh uh, shamefully for no sufficient reason, and even boast about their actions. There is no one to stop the flood and put an end to this despicable and dangerous tendency. Our brothers indeed were right when they said that the Arab only respects he who exhibits bravery and courage. But when these people feel that the law is on their rival's side, and even more so, if they are right to think that their rival's actions are unjust and oppressive, saying that the Arabs, if they think that their actions are unjust and oppressive, then even if they are silent and endlessly reserved, they keep their anger in their hearts and these people will be revengeful like no other. This is a warning to the Jewish people that if they continue there, it will ignite basically a war between the Palestinian people and them. Now, as I said, the Zionists tried to buy out Sultan Abdul Hamid and they offered him many things and he famously said, I won't sell anything, not even an inch of this territory because this Palestine does not belong to me but to all the Ottomans, he's meaning all the Muslims. My people won these lands with their blood. We give what we have the way we got in the first place. We give what we have the way we got it in the first place. Basically meaning you're not going to buy it from us, so you'll have to take it uh, with us from force. Now this is an interesting YouTube clip, if anyone's interested, where they dramatized this meeting between um, the Abdul Hamid II and Theodore Hortzel. Uh, so you can take a look at that uh, on YouTube. I think we're going to play it at the end of the event, inshallah. Um, okay, so now the British conquest. 1917, you know, this is World War I, and Britain actually 
It's a sad part of our history, but actually allies the Arab nations, and, he, and there's Lawrence of Arabia that's there as well, conjuring up this Arab nationalism. Why are you under these Turkic people? This is a Mus you're Muslim, your prophet was Arab, and you know, you know why are you uh, under these people? And we will help you reclaim Jerusalem. We will help you maintain Hejaz as well in Mecca and Medina. And so help us to conquer, and we will give you a piece of the pie. And of course, they double-crossed the Arabs and the Muslims. And with the aid of Arab nations, Muslims that are there, with the uh, British people, the British people conquer Jerusalem. And uh, they had stirred up, uh, yeah, and so they, they enter into Jerusalem, and it's very sad. And there's a video, actually, footage of them coming in. Now, this is not the Zionists at this point. This is just the British government who has control of the region. Chaim Wiseman, who was a chemist, he developed a proprietary method to build acetone, which is a very important ingredient in bombs. And so he gave this to the British for free in exchange for the aid in establishing Palestine as the Jewish homeland. So now the British, they are trying to get this land and try to defeat the Ottomans. And so he, they're, planning, they're, they're, they're promising it to the Arabs, but he's actually making this deal with wise men, which is going to save the country literally millions and billions of dollars by getting this patent for free. Now, this is an important side note as well. Look at the, the, the idea of when Muslims are at the top of things or people are at the top and the influence they're able to carry. This person didn't spend a cent. It was literally just his intellect. This proprietary thing that's there, money talks, finance talks, influence talks. And now the British people will then go and bend over backwards to try and build this Jewish homeland in a way that they didn't even think was going to be as we're going to see. So the Balfour Declaration is given in 1917. And this is given to a business person, a Jewish business person in England, where a government official sends a message declaring their intention for the Jewish homeland in Palestine. So obviously they're promising it to the Arabs, but now this letter is being sent. And during this time of 1917 to 1920, there's martial law, it's governed by the British people. And so you can see there some of the Brit British uh, soldiers that are there uh, and the French as well that are there as well. Now during this time, Jewish settlements are increasing. They're coming between 1919 to 1929. 120,000 Jews were translocated to Palestine from Eastern Europe. And they were funded by wealthy Zionists from places like in Europe, in America, and all these different places. Now in response to this, there's a frustration from the Palestinians. Why? We learned in the late 1800s how, it's not like they just settle and live their life. The harassment, the beating, all those things. You remember the quotes I mentioned from the Jewish people themselves. That is what's happening. It's not simply these people are coming to live. Rather, they're coming and they are harassing the Muslims and they are oppressing them. And so there's a lot of uh, uh, different, uh, uh, you know, um, you can say flights and, fights and conflicts that break out uh, there. There's a rally that's there in 1920, that's a picture there by the Damascus Gate from the old city of Jerusalem of people, anti-Zionists, of trying to stop or at least slow down the Jewish immigration that's coming to Palestine. Now, in this time, the Haganah, who are Zionist militants, they start to form and they start to train. And they establish this military organization to harass, harass the Muslims and to protect the Jewish settlers. So you can imagine a Jewish settler comes in a land that's not theirs, and so people are trying to get it back, and now you have this militia group that is there to defend the settlers. Now these are some, the Nabi Musa riots of 1920 was an example where Jewish people came with, the, the Zionists came with their knives, and they started an entire riot uh, by Nabi Musa. It's, it's said Nabi Musa is a place in Palestine where the grave of, of uh, Musa Islam is. And uh, it captured headlines all around the world of what was happening there. Now at this point, the British are like, there's too much happening. So they started to impose immigration quotas, saying we, this is happening too fast. People are just coming in. We need to slow down the immigration. And there's big media censorship as well, by the way, of what's actually happening on the ground. Nobody's seeing the, um, the, 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 the horrific treatment towards the Palestinians. 1921, a year later, there's the riots of Yaffa. And it started off as a fight actually internally between two, two Jewish political parties because they themselves were disunited and then it eventually broke off and there were these riots. 47 uh, Muslims, uh, sorry, 48 Muslims died, 47 uh, Zionists died. 1922, the year after, the League of Nations declare the British mandate. That is now for 
Britain. They literally sliced up the pie. Like if you look at that, that's not a natural border. They literally just sliced up the pie of the whole Muslim world that was there, of the Ottoman world, and that is what was given to the British. And it was called Transjordan. So it includes Jordan, it includes Palestine, it includes all these different areas. Now, Article 22 of the League of Nations, the idea was to move towards a situation where everyone have their independent state. Jordan, Lebanon, all these places, they would have their independent states. Once they would be ready to basically take that on without much difficulty, including Palestine as a state. So that was the idea of the British. So at this point, the British were thinking, we're going to, because we're in control, we're going to bring Jewish immigration. So they lived there, and that's a place for them, away from the anti-Semitism and these sorts of things. And they're there. But it's going to be Palestinian land. There's no concept that this is Israelis, even from the British people. And so the Brits thought, okay, then we're going to turn into a Palestinian state, and khalas, that will be it. So that was from the League of Nations in 1922. Now, many things start to happen during this time. Firstly, it's an empty promise. No Palestinian state is given, no independence is given. The British stay there literally until 1947. Why? Because there's so much fighting, there's so much chaos. More, you know, Zionists are coming in, they're causing riots. They're breaking the rules that the British people are putting upon them. There's lots of conflict between the Zionists and the Brits because the Brits are trying to control things and the Zionists are keep pushing the button and, and putting their pedal to the metal. The Wailing Wall incident uh, occurs, uh, which was a great, uh, 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 great killing as well on both sides. And um, now we get in 1930, the Irgun terrorist group. The Irgun terrorist group is an offshoot of the Haganah. Remember the Haganah? The ones who were the militias who were building or who were, uh, you know, bringing with their weapons and everything like this. And they were harassing the Arabs and they were protecting the settlers. The Irgun terrorist group, the offshoot of the Haganah, uh, they were even more uh, militant and even more extreme. They thought the Haganah were too soft. And this is, as you can see, the propaganda that they would spread. As you can see there, what does it say? The entire Transjordan. Erez Israel, Ard Israel, the land of Israel. And they have the rifle that is there. SubhanAllah. You can see the extremism that is there. They want that entire place to be Israel. And eventually the Irgun, by the way, absorbs into the IDF in 1948. So these extremist elements, they exist within the IDF, which is the Israeli Defense Force. And they're spreading this propaganda about, you know, we're going to conquer this entire place and it's going to be ours. Nazi Germany happens, of course, as we know, and so more and more Jews are coming to Palestine. The Arab Revolt in 1936 to 1939, so there's an actual, a bit more of a formalized revolt against the immigration of the Europeans. Um, they killed Izzuddin al-Qassam. Izzuddin al-Qassam was a resistance movement. He was a Syrian scholar that was trying to resist this infiltration and invasion of the Palestinian land. And uh, the British eventually had to really quell things uh, and use international diplomacy to stop all these demonstrations. And uh, they basically tried to um, stop the, um, they tried to stop more of the Jewish kind of settlements that were happening in uh, Palestine to help stop a lot of the, uh, the conflict that was happening there and to flare up the situation. And uh, you know, subhanAllah, you have this admission from Ben Gurion who is going to be the first Prime Minister of Israel later. And he said, let us not ignore the truth amongst ourselves. We are the aggressors and they are defending themselves. SubhanAllah, this is the first Prime Minister of Israel. And he said, let's not ignore that amongst ourselves. Admitting that to everyone else, they sell a different picture, a sob story. But let, let's realize that we are the aggressors here. And he basically says, if I was an Arab leader, I'd do the exact same thing that they are doing. Now, the British, they try to put this policy in. Um, where essentially they wanted to uh, have an independent Palestinian state within 10 years, a one-state solution, and that would be a place for the Jews to be able to live there. And they restricted the immigration to 150,000 per year. And they restricted the Jews to buying 5% of whatever the British mandate was of the Arab land. And the Zionists were absorbed, very upset with this, and they led protests in Britain, as you can see here in the picture here, that's in... Uh, you can see in Britain, you must save the lives of the Jewish, uh, you know, from Germany, sign the petition. So they're using this, the Holocaust to try and justify more settlements and more invasion from the Jewish people. Um, now, the UN is formed in 1945, and um, subhanAllah, the US President Truman, from Zionist pressure, 
pushed 100,000 Jews to be sent to Palestine. And the British agreed for this increased immigration quota only if the Irgun militants would be disbanded because they were doing so much of the killing and all these things and causing problems. So they said, if you disband yourselves, we will allow this. In response, what did the Irgun do? They blew up, this is in Jerusalem, they blew up the King David Hotel, killing 91 British people. And you can see the picture there. So you can see the tensions between the Zionists and the British. Now, the UN General Assembly in 1947 proposes a two-state solu uh, partition solution. And that's the solution that we understand even to this day as well, and most people attest to. At the time, there was 1.2 million Muslims, or sorry, Arabs, I should say, Palestinians, Muslims and Christians, and Jews as well, and then the Zionists, 678,000. And they owned at that time only 10% of the land. In 1947, you see the pictures you can see of the two maps. So, sorry, that's wrong on the slide. I should say 1947 UN partition plan. So you see 1947, the blue is all Palestine, and the white is where the Zionists are. And what they proposed in 1947 was the picture on the right. Who is going to accept this? Obviously, hindsight is 2020, but at the time, the Palestinians, of course, rejected this. How are you going to uh, you know, remove so much of the land from the Muslims? And so then... Um, you have in 1948, the Irgun terrorists, they raid one of the villages, they stuff, you know, they kill 254 Palestinian women. They wait for the men to go working on the fields and they go and they pillage all the women and the children and the elderly who could not fight in their homes. They stuffed the bodies in the wells and dumped it into the rivers. And there were even unborn children inside the wombs that they butchered and all these things. And this was to become the blueprint for Palestine land. So the Irgun said, as in Deir Yasin, so everywhere. That was a slogan. Can you imagine that? That was the blueprint to them of how they were going to take over Palestine in that particular fashion. And they did. And subhanAllah, look at the response from the Zionists. Kaim Wiseman, he's the chemist who made the acetone. He said, a miraculous clearing of the land. Hundreds of villages retreated like Deir Yasin. And Deir Yasin itself became part of Greater Jerusalem, and the Jewish people took control, and they bulldozed the cemetery there, and it's now basically a highway, and the street is named after the Irgun units that massacred the people there. And 1948 is the birth of Israel as a political state and the Nakba. Uh, and that's something that we recognize in Australia. There's always that protest on, May for, on, on, on that weekend of May 14th, 15th. On May 14th, the Zionist leaders, they declared the state of Israel. Remember, up until this point, the British were very clear. Palestinian state. The Jews can live there in the Palestinian state. So now these Zionist extremists, they declare the land of Israel. By the way, this is exactly comparable to ISIS afterwards, where they went and they declared, we are the Islamic state. This is the exact same thing. But because they were backed by the U.S., recognized by the U.S. And the reason for this is the Zionists, there was a huge support for them from the evangelicals. We won't go into that for now. But the evangelicals see the Israelis coming as part of their end of time, you know, to bring forward Isa Alayhi essentially. That's one of the reasons why they support them. And so Russia and U.S. were the only two countries that recognized Israel. Nobody else recognized Israel. It was out of nowhere. May 15th, the Nakba started, where, as they did in Deir Yassin, hundreds of villages. 700,000 Palestinians were in exile this year. They had to leave and force from their lands. Two million over the next few decades, two million Palestinians are displaced. Um, and in 1948, uh, on May 20th, the UN appoints uh, uh, Count Bernadotte as a mediator. And he said that the 1947, uh, the border basically lines, the two-state solution, was provisional. If they accept those borders, then Israel will be recognized. So the UN said, we'll only recognize you as a state if you go to the borders that we had in 1947 outlined for you. Otherwise, we'll not recognize you. And what did they do? They killed him. The Jewish radicals, they killed Bernadette. Then a year later, UN recognizes the state of Israel, no conditions. And so that is the birth of Israel. And in response to this, there's the great Arab-Israeli war where you have the Egyptians, the Jordanians, the Syrians, which are at least for the Jordanians and Syrians, they're all the same people. And they get forces from Iraq as well, and they come and they try to fight you know, Israel and resist. But of course, these are people who are backed by the Europeans, by the Americans, and their weapons and everything like this. Uh, eventually, at the end of that, West Bank is annexed to Jordan. 
and Egypt takes uh, uh, Gaza. Uh, 700,000 Palestinians become refugees in these Arab lands, Egypt and Jordan, Syria and Lebanon. Uh, the PLO was formed in 1964. So in 1964, the Palestinian Liberation Organization is formed. Yasser Arafat, who was to become uh, the leader uh, in the 90s, was elected the chair at the time. And their focus was to really bring back the Palestinian people. And you can see there the map, subhanAllah, blue is Palestine on the left. That was the 1947 borders. The one after that, that one is after the Arab-Israeli war. That's what it became. So you see West Bank with Jordan, and you see Egypt that gets Gaza. Then after that, you see in 67 what happens with the region. And then subhanAllah, you see to this day in, 19, in 1993 how uh, the land of the Palestinians is dwindling. And those little white spots in the between, Amina will get to it in her presentation. That's where the Israeli settlements are through, all throughout West Bank. Um, so lots of things happen. There are lots of wars that are done. Six Day War, the Yom Kippur War. A lot of the Arabs are trying to fight against Israel. But of course, how can you fight against a force that is backed by the superpowers of the time? And um, there's the Six Day War. We won't go into it just in the interest of time. And then there's the occupation of West Bank and Gaza from 1967 up until today. Um, I put 2021. This is the old slides. Obviously, up until today, 2022. And you can see there as well, and we saw these turnstiles as well when we were there, as Amina will get into. And the UN officially recognizes this as an occupation uh, in West Bank, and particularly, especially in Gaza, the open air prison. Um, the Camp David Accords in 1978. So basically, Egypt had one military victory over Israel. And it was with Anwar Sadat, and they were able to get back the Sinai Peninsula. So it was a big part of Egypt that they were able to get back from the Israelis. But then Israel then took it back. But the Israelis were, a bit, Israelis were a bit scared of the Egyptians. So they struck a deal, and it was called the Camp David Accords, that if you recognize Israel, we will give you Sinai. And so they recognized Israel as a state. Egypt did. And they were the first Muslim country to ever recognize Israel. And in 1981, three years later, a jihad was to become a jihadist group. They assassinated Anwar Sadat for this involvement in this peace agreement, and they saw it as a betrayal, which of course it was. Uh, now the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation you know, Organization, they are basically involved in this guerrilla warfare during this time. They're trying to get their land back. They don't have much. The Zionists are using this to claim these are terrorists. We're defending ourselves now, et cetera, et cetera. The PLO gains UN status in 1974 to 1987. So in 1974, um, sorry, they gained UN status. So they're an observer status in 1974, and according to the UN. So not a legit, like a full state, but they're observer member of the UN. So they're not a legitimate kind of participant, you can say, in the UN. In 1987, the USA considered them to be a terrorist organization. And this is the marking of the first intifada in 1987. And the intifada is the insurrection or the revolution, you can say. Grassroot revolution from the people, of course, up until this time, the occupation, the humiliation, the beating, the expulsions, the trauma from the Nakba, all this obviously goes into this. And during this time, you had 1,700 Israeli soldiers and 1,400 Israeli civilians killed. And then you had, of course, 1,000 Palestinians killed, 330 children, 120,000 arrests, and 2,500 2, homes that were demolished. The aftermath of the first intifada. Palestine declares their independence and it's accepted by 100 nations. Look at the contrast. When Israel declared, two. When Palestine declares, 100. But it was not granted statehood by the UN still because of course, you know what happens in the UN. It's, uh, there's only a few countries that really control things. 1988, Jordan proclaimed this legal separation of the West Bank and in 1988, the PLO endorses the two-state solution contingent on East Jerusalem as the capital, a Palestinian right of return to the land occupied by the Palestinians prior to 1948. That's referring to in what's Israel. These were lands that people lived in, their homes for thousands of years sometimes. So that's the second. So first is East Jerusalem as the capital, which is where Aqsa is. Number two is the right of return from the refugees. Uh, and uh, the, uh, basically, they were happy with these 67 borders that were there to the 67 borders that the UN had written up. In 93, you had the Oslo Accords with Yasser Arafat, where he recognized the state of Israel. And this was the first time that the Palestinian organization had done that. And, and it's his letter to the prime minister. Uh, because they were wanting to basically get 
what, we, what they wanted in 1988, which was a separate Palestinian state, the right of return and all these things, and they thought that this would be a step there, and the Oslo Accords commissioned by uh, President Kil uh, Clinton. And you can see there uh, the picture of uh, Yasser Arafat that is there. Um, many Palestinians felt betrayed as well. There's a lot of mixed feelings about this agreement and whatnot. And because, of course, Yasser Arafat was in the 70s in the head of the liberation movement, and now he recognized them, and it didn't lead anywhere. This recognition led to nowhere in terms of the Palestinian rights. And so you have the second Intifada, also known as the Aqsa Intifada, 2000, 2005. Many of us uh, remember this. Uh, for many, many years, uh, a long, drawn out protest and whatnot in regards to this. And it all started because. Ariel Sharon's provocative visit to the Temple Mount. Because to this day, it is forbidden for Mus uh, you know, the Jewish people to go to Aqsa. It should have been at least, even according to their own law. So when they would come, they would provoke the people. Because think about it, from these people, when the Jewish people come, it means we're coming to take over. So it means then, Aqsa will be gone. So these are literally people who are in Rabat. They are defending Al-Aqsa to keep Masjid Al-Aqsa for the Muslims. And they're literally throwing stones and anything that they can do. And they've been resisting for decades. Because if they relent, and if they relented at this point, Aqsa would not have been for the Muslims. And you and I would not have been able to go there and pray there. Now Hamas, I won't go into this we, uh, just in the, in, in the um, interest of time. But Hamas uh, uh, stands for Harakat al-Muqawamat al islamiya uh, and it has two wings, a social wing, which is the Da'wah, and the military wing, Izz al-Din al-Qassam, remember the Syrian uh, revivalist uh, brigade. Um, so just the facts here, declared as a terrorist organization only by the USA, European Union, Canada, and Japan. Australia, New Zealand, Paraguay, and UK classify only its military wing as a quote-unquote terrorist organization. It's not considered a terrorist organization at all from Brazil, China, Egypt, Iran, Norway, Qatar, Russia, Syria, and Turkey. And in December 2018, the UN General Assembly rejected the US resolution that condemned Hamas as a terrorist organization. Um, it's an, okay, I won't go into this just about Hamas. The Gaza, the Gaza and Israeli war from 2008 to 2009. So this was the exchange of the rockets and bombs. Then there was a ceasefire that was uh, agreed to in 2009. And of course, the disproportionate attacks from Israel to Gaza in this air, open air prison that they were indiscriminately targeting. Civilians and children were dying. Hospitals were being destroyed. You know, uh, uh, schools were being destroyed as well. And 2014, subhanAllah, the, one of the most recent ones, they killed 2,100 people in Gaza after seven weeks of non-stop attack. 1,400 of which were civilians and were not mili military people. 18,000 homes were destroyed during this 50-day military operation. And uh, Gaza in 2017, uh, Hamas actually adjusted their charter, no longer calling for the destruction of Israel because that was their initial uh, you know, idea. But rather, they call for the liberation of the Palestinian people and to confront the Zionist project. And they accept the 1967 borders to establish a Palestinian state. Um, and this was, uh, there was a reconciliation agreement side between Gaza and West Bank in this regard, because obviously they had different strategic visions. But now they really came together in this regard in 2017. Now, you look at the 2020 Amnesty International report, and you find all the different reports. This is an independent report that has been commissioned. Forcible transfers, transfers, forced evictions, demolitions, discrimination, unlawful killings, freedom of movement uh, that has been uh, stopped, arbitrary detention, unfair trials, torture. All of this found in the Amnesty International report, UN, recog uh, UN recognized report of all these human rights violations in, this was the report in 2020. Now, tw May 2021, which was last year, Ramadan, we all remember, we were all thinking whether or not this may have led to a third intifada with what happened in Sheikh Jarrah and then the uh, bombings and attacks of Al-Aqsa itself uh, and then the celebration of the Israeli people. Now, to conclude uh, my section, uh, here are some common Zionist arguments. So, Jazakallah Khair for being with me for about an hour and 20 minutes, Alhamdulillah. Um, so, after all of this, what do the Zionists say? They say, number one, Israel was born in sin just like all Western countries, so why should they have to give their land back? That's their number one argument. Uh, th that's one of the arguments that they give. Oh, the Western people, they did with the natives people, so why us? I mean, this is really what about tree to the culmination. You're admitting at this point what you've done to the people. The difference is, of course, is that with the Aboriginal people, the, uh, the, the, the uh, Western countries destroyed and decimated them, and there was no will of resistance after a certain point of time, when all this was recognized at this time. 
you have now still the Palestinian people who are holding on to land, who are holding on to a resolution, who actually, you have, they have not, their spirit has not been destroyed. And that is one of the beautiful things about the Palestinians. The real war was not over land, it was over the will of the Palestinian people. And they failed to break the will of the Palestinian people. After hundred, uh, more than a hundred years, the Palestinian people are even of more fervor to defend their lands. You know, subhanAllah, the Israelis will go, and I'm going to go into this probably, and they will offer millions of dollars with U.S. citizen or Canadian citizenship and immigration papers for small lands in West Bank. And they'll refuse. They'll refuse. And they'll say, Palestine is not for sale. That is the will of the Palestinian people. Uh, the UN, and then another argument, they'll say the UN recognized the legitimacy of Israel in 1949. And then you just say, well, look what happened the year before that. What did you do to Bernadotte, who said, we want to go to the 1947 borders? You killed him. So what are you going to go? You want to go to the UN resolution? And you want to go into the UN history? And then the bombing of Camp David? And then they'll say, where should have all the Jews of Europe gone? They say, Khalas, what kind of argument is this? Where should they have gone? So we're now going to displace these people, millions of people, literally thousands of people killed. That's your justification because you don't know where else to go. Khalas, if the Americans care so much, they have so much land in America. You can go to Arizona. You can go all, wherever you want. Find a place in Europe. Why are you going to a place here and uh, destroying the people and removing them all? The Jews are subjugated to constant attack and harassment throughout the century by the Arabs. This is just laughable as you see. I mean, uh, you come into a land and you destroy their people and people are now resisting and now you're complaining about that. Uh, Israel is defending itself with strong measures to avert harm to its citizens. The disproportionate attacks. That's their, um, uh, their justification. And of course, you don't then care about the Palestinian citizens. So you've dehumanized them. You've clearly said now the Israeli Humanity is more important to you than the Palestinians. And then they say, Jewish people have the original right to the land. Now we went through that history before and you see, what original right to the land? When are you talking about? The few hundred years where the kingdom of Sulaiman and Dawud which by the way, the Muslims believe in as well. Because after that, it was the Babylonians, Cyrus the Great, the Persians, then the Romans, then the Muslims, then what we have now. So which original time are you talking about? And before that, of course, there were no Jewish people there. Ibrahim wasn't even there. It was Canaan. And the Canaanites, the indigenous people, they are the ones, the Muslims and the Christians, they are the original inhabitants of the land. So this notion is also completely false. So to conclude, Alhamdulillah, we've gone through the history of Jerusalem, the Jerusalem story. This is a story throughout the centuries that is a Muslim story. It is the place that is the center of the prophets. It is the place that is Ard al-Mubarak. It is Ard al-Muqaddas. It is the holy land. It is the blessed land. It is a place that for the last hundred of years, last 200 years, the Muslims started with the Ottomans. Literally, if the Ottomans wanted, they could have become rich with their agreements with the Zionists. They could have kept their empire if they got in bed with the Zionists and they would have still been existing to some level that we'd understand to this day. But they sacrificed. And then the Palestinians sacrificed. And then the blood of the, of the children, the blood of the parents, the blood of the scholars, the blood of the, of the soldiers, to this day, resisting to keep the land for the Muslims. When you go there, and, and, and Amina is going to get to this point, when you go there, that is what they say they are. They say, we are in Rabat. We are keeping this place in Aqsa so you can come and pray here and make salah and get that ajr that the Prophet ﷺ said of salvation, subhanAllah. This is not a small thing to pray there two rakahs. You come out like you were just born. It is literally the reward of hajj. And so the Palestinian people are resisting and resisting and resisting and it is up to us as believers, as Muslims to support them in this in the ways that we can. Jazakum wa khairan, barakallah feek. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, that's a big height difference. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Zuhair. Um, 
Now, Dr. Zuhair and his wife, Amina, have recently traveled to Palestine. Um, and I'm a huge fan of Amina, so of course, I watched their trip and as she shared her stories on Instagram. And through those stories and experiences, I was motivated more than ever to plan my own visit to Al-Aqsa. So, um, inshallah, that will become a reality. Her stories and reflections that she shared was actually the inspiration for today's event. Um, and so I'll ask her to come up and share these stories with, with all of you. But I do warn you that when you leave today, you will be on Skyscanner looking for the next available flight. <laughs> um, Sister Amina Khan is an award-winning fitness and health coach. Her goal is to inspire Muslim women to start exercising with her modest at-home workouts. Um, she is currently completing her PhD in psychology, and she is passionate about empowering Muslim women towards positive self-development from, from an Islamic and faith-based perspective via her online platform, Amana Fitness. She currently teaches a monthly girls' class right here at Academy Alive called Queens of Paradise, and that is aimed to revive the legacy of Muslim women through learning about the, companion, the female companions of the Prophet ﷺ. So for all of you ladies and all of you watching, please do come out to these future classes. Um, she's a powerful speaker and one of my personal role models, Amina Khan. Jazakallah <laughs> khair. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Um, if we can maybe get the slides up, that would be great. Perfect. All right, so, um, you know, I know that going through the history can sometimes, you know, be a challenging endeavor. Thank you, Zohair, for going through all of that. And it's so important to know, right, because when you have this grounding, this background understanding in the history of Palestine and how we've gotten to occupation until today, when you're there itself, everything takes on a new meaning and everything has such a deep history that you're able to better appreciate. So my section is not going to be as, uh, you know, as, as granular as Zohair's was. This is kind of going to be like a bit of a travel log taking you through our experience there taking you through um, you know some of the things that we saw and if we can switch to the slide so my goal here is to really encourage you all and provide you with some information so that you feel motivated to actually go and plan a trip to Palestine with your family many Muslim families we have a culture of going for Umrah maybe we're gonna go to Turkey but there's not the same culture of traveling to Palestine and when you you go through the stories when you see how it is you realize this is an absolute must for all of us to go and see and support our Palestinian brothers and sisters there um, also just want to share again some of more of that lived reality of occupation and what life is like even in a very small capacity and how that affects the Palestinian lives and especially the privilege that we have with our Western passports going in there why we really need to use that to again be a support for our brothers and sisters inshallah so jumping in you know traveling to Tel Aviv um, you can kind of see from Australia it is a long journey right you're talking looking at around 26 hours usually go to Melbourne fly all the way to the Middle East and then connect into Tel Aviv so it's a long journey and again if you're thinking of going for Umrah this is a long journey in and of itself, so I really want to encourage you to start thinking that if you're planning an Umrah trip, I really, really encourage you to try and build in a way to stop in Palestine, even if it's only for a few days, for the many reasons that we will get to, inshallah. So going in there, you know, you're, you're having this long journey, if we can switch to the side. Um, so uh, go back one more. Awesome. So, you know, oftentimes people are concerned going into Palestine. Is it safe? How will, how will I cross the border? Um, oh, I don't want to go and support uh, Tel Aviv. And so sometimes people will make the journey even harder, you know, by trying to fly into Jordan. And so you can kind of see the two ways that you could get into, into Jerusalem. So you can either fly into the Tel Aviv airport and you go through a security process there. Of course, there's longer security delays. But from there, it's like a 46 minute drive into Jerusalem. Or your other option, which again, many people do saying, I'm not going to fly to Tel Aviv, so they'll fly into Jordan, and then they'll take this much longer two-hour route 
to drive over two borders now because now you have to exit Jordan then you have to enter into Israel and a no man's land between them you're gonna have much longer travel you're gonna have a two-hour drive and countless hours waiting and processing and going through this arduous journey to get there and either way you're going to be passing through Israel you're going to be passing into the Israeli border you're gonna be paying border fees but again the the objective here is to go and be with the Palestinians and support them in a much greater way and as we'll discuss in a way that the Palestinian people are asking us, the international Muslim community, to come and support them with our dollars. So you have some options on how you're going to get into uh, Israel and get into Jerusalem. And so the first question everyone asks is, did you get stopped by security? How was the kind of situation going in there? We can switch the slide. Um, so definitely, you know, as you're flying in, you have this kind of sense of nervousness. You're not sure what's, what it's going to be like. We've heard many horror stories of people who travel all the way there. You know, they stop, they get interrogated, maybe they're not even allowed entry. So essentially, you know, you need to expect delays. You need to expect this nosy questioning, these hassles. But SubhanAllah, again, we need to reflect on the immense privilege that comes with a Western passport. For us, it's a hassle. You just sit in the airport for a couple hours. And it's nothing compared to the hardships that the Palestinians face every single day, going through borders, going through checkpoints, having restrictions on the, on the way they can go to study on their job and so just going through that honestly gives you that little bit of extra appreciation even in a small capacity for how it is for the Palestinians still there even though it is in no way comparable so you go in there and again they're of course targeting young Muslims right young Muslims are the ones who they want to flag they want to ask questions to um, some older Muslims will go through breeze through versus when we were there uh, you know we were stopped for about an hour and a half and uh, you know the weirdest questions that you'll ever get at any airport will will be asked to you so you know and immediately me and Zohair were flagged at the security counter and then they told Zohair to go sit down and they want to talk to me because one of their tactics is to speak to the women in the family because they assume they can get some dirt on the rest of the family through this so they you know they usually speak to the women and they ask the most bizarre questions right so they ask what is your father's name what was your father's father's name where was he born how did your how did your parents meet how did they get married when did they get married and like I mean you know you'd never expect this in any other way but, but then they get to the question they're trying to get at which is has anyone in your family ever had a Palestinian ID and so obviously any connection that you have with Palestine is going to mean a more and more difficult procedure at the border crossing through. And then if you're going with a group, you know, again, such, such questions that, it, that you will never experience anywhere else, right? Like, why did you go with this group? What is, your, what is your objective coming here? How did you find out about the group? Do you know anyone else in the group? Who is the sheikh leading the group? What's the organizer's phone numbers, you know? And this level of really probing, digging into it, trying to find out what you will be doing in, uh, in, in Jerusalem. And again, you want to hear, be simplifying your travel plans. So uh, right here, these two guys. Um, these guys were sitting in the airport in the VIP questioning area. And I have a picture of them because we later bumped into them in Jerusalem. And we're like, oh, hey, we recognize you. So they had been waiting there for two and a half hours. And they were waiting for so long because they had just come from Lebanon. And so the more complicated your travel plans, the more likely you are to get stopped. So it was apparently suspicious that they had been in Lebanon. And so they were interrogated to such a degree. What were you doing in Lebanon? Why did you go there? Why would you, even, why would you white boys even want to go to Lebanon? Why are you coming here? To, and, and to the level that asking every single detail about their life, their work, their interest in Palestine. Um, this guy came out of the, the security screening area. He was like shaking. He's like, they asked me everything. Then they took his brother in there. They did the same thing with him. So really this, this thorough interrogation. So just as a general tip, simplify your travel plans and, you know, kind of you're going in there. And again, you know, they're, they're, it depends on different people, depends on your demographic when you're going there. And the key here is to just be very truthful, very open, and really, you know, have this and speak to them saying that, you know, if you're asked about your beliefs about Palestine, about Israel, you know, really saying that we want justice for everyone. 
everyone. And you know, even there, if you you know, sometimes you might have concerns. Oh, I've been donating to organizations that you know provide medical aid for Palestine, and you know, will they bring that up? And again, coming back to that truthful response that you know, well, I thought that Israel is for supporting medical aid. Is that not the case? Because I want to provide medical aid. So really, just having that truthful response coming in there, and uh, you know, going through security like that, and again understanding that this is nothing, this is just a small hassle that we experience compared to what the Palestinians go through. And none of the pictures of Israeli security or the soldiers are mine because you can't take any pictures of them. So those are from Google. Um, but uh, so going through there, so you finally, you leave the airport. Um, again, just the subtle ways that you'll see this level of oppression, right? So Palestinian drivers are not allowed to wait. Israeli drivers are the only ones allowed to wait. So it's kind of a bit of a, a touch and go game to find your driver, get into the car, because obviously you want to be supporting the Palestinians there. You connect with your Palestinian driver and they start driving you into Jerusalem, you know, 46 minute drive or so. And as you start to get closer to Jerusalem, you know, you really start to understand the city. So you have this, you know, kind of downtown Jerusalem, which is where a lot of the hotels are, which is like a kilometer away from the old city walls. So the old city walls basically encircle this area that is split into the Muslim quarter, Christian quarter, Armenian quarter, and Jewish quarter. And there's multiple different gates and entrance. So Zohar had actually put up a picture of a protest in front of Damascus Gate right here, which is what this looks like. And SubhanAllah, you, you walk about a kilometer from your hotel into this, these old city walls, and it's immediately like you're transported back in time, right? You have these corrugated um, you know, roads, and you're walking through them, and the way that the old city has been design is so incredible like architecturally it's all shaped around the Aqsa mosque right so at every kind of little corner you'll just see a peak or a glimpse of the dome poking out you know you'll just see as you're starting to wind your way through these old city streets you know there's the adhan that is going to start flowing through and so it's just this incredible sensation of these sounds and smells you know lined with shops and you know it's kind of like each of these shops will be playing a different surah as you walk by especially as you're going Going through the Muslim quarter and this level of welcoming of people just so happy to see you it, there as a Muslim walking through the old city subhanAllah so you're walking through and you'll see okay, next slide um, you know throughout there so these are some of the you know you'll see these store stalls and food right so this is Cack bread, a very kind of common breakfast bread. And you'll see these kind of Palestinians will be lifting these huge carts, pushing them through the street. And again, just that they're so happy you're there. Like they'll see you with the camera, they'll be like, yeah. Like, you know, they're just so delighted you're there. You know, so many things on the street. And honestly, if, normally in other countries, you'd say, I don't want to eat street food, right? The Palestinians are very clean people, honestly. And like the way that they prepare their food, it, you know, it's one of the only places that I would eat street food. <laughs> Next slide. So, you so you're going through the, the city walls. Again, there's so many incredible markets there. You have these beautiful fruits, right? And so there's, you know, they say that the land of Palestine, the soil itself, is blessed. And so you get these amazing fruits that, honestly, you won't taste them anywhere else, right? These juicy figs, big juicy of these uh, yellow dragon fruits, um, and so many spices. You know, you're just going through these streets, and, and it's such an experience, right? This is the whole experience of walking through these cities. It's a walled city, right? So these are 500 year old walls that were built during the Ottoman times so you, you kind of are really are stepping back in history here and then you get closer and closer and you get that peak of Aqsa Mosque and you just get you know and here is where it, in this corner of the old city is where the area of Aqsa Mosque is Next slide. and so here is where you know things start to get a bit interesting because there are 10 uh, current active gates to Aqsa Mosque. Five of them are closed. So there's 15 total gates, 10 are open, five are closed. There's massive green um, gates. And on the outside of each of these gates is a group of Israeli soldiers who basically are controlling access in and out of the mosque. So for Western travelers, you always have to keep your passport with you um, because at all times, so they can kind of check in with here. So I never 
had a problem going in and out. Every time Zohar would go in, they would say, prove you're Muslim, recite Surah Fatiha, right? And so they just, this is this game of just harassing Muslims and it's a power play. And you'll see how it's this level of power play. They're standing there with these massive machine guns. Like we are not used to seeing this, right? Just these people with these massive guns just standing there. And they have this level of, of just such arrogance that they have and you know, constantly stopping, harassing Muslims going in there. There was one um, convert brother, older brother in our uh, tour group and he had the worst time because he didn't look as Muslim and so every time he'd go in and out they would say prove you're Muslim and they said show us your passport and he said my passport's not going to show you that I'm Muslim and so then they turned immediately they pointed their machine guns at him he was so shaken up he's he's from the UK I mean you know imagine getting to encircled and having machine guns pointed at you so this is kind of that that control that comes in and again you'll see so much that the entire objective here is about narrative control and so previously you know when visitors would come and they would visit Aqsa Mosque there were many conversions a lot of people would be converting to Islam and so they wanted to again regulate that, restrict it, make it tighter so they control the narrative. So more tighter control on Oh, you know, restricting to, to, to harass Muslims in this way. And then when non-Muslims do visit, really, again, control the narrative and paint history, really rebrand history in a very particular way to, again, just support the Zionist narrative. So you go through, you know, again, this is a hassle. Uh, and subhanAllah, as we kind of go through the slides and you'll kind of see how the way that we go in and we might say that's such a hassle, there's literally Palestinians who live 10 kilometers away who have never been to Aqsa Mosque. And you've flown this way and you're just walking through and they've never been and it's their dream to go in. But, you know, subhanAllah, that's that, that's that privilege we have um, and that's that kind of like that struggle. So you walk through these gates. And on the other side, kind of the countermeasure is the Palestinian guards. So this is um, Sheikh Samer, and so he is one of the Palestinian guards. He did a lot of the tours at, at Aqsa Mosque. And again, you just see the contrast in their styles, right? You know, he's, he's, he's relaxed, he's joking. SubhanAllah, he sleeps four hours every few days. And, uh, you know, he, he go, he's, he's, you know, just this kind of like, happy person he's just like you know just so honored to be in Aqsa and he and and you see that there's this counter counter force of how the Palestinian guards respond to the Israeli soldiers this is the key to one of the uh the gates and so Sheikh Samer had actually he had he had gone and he had uh brought this, this key because he wanted to show our group. And again, just this was like a, a little power display where the Israeli soldiers, they, you know, there was a bit of a tussle, like, why did you bring this key out here, right? And then he was like, no, it's fine. I just want to show the key. And then they kind of got into a little verbal altercation right there. But there's this kind of push and pull between the Israeli soldiers and the Palestinian guards. So you, you finally make it in. You finally go through and getting closer towards Aqsa Mosque. And here is, of course, where you have that first look moment at Aqsa Mosque. And you have this moment of just really kind of entering the eye of the storm, like this calm in this, this really tense situation around it. And you go to Aqsa, and honestly, I have not felt a place that has this level of peace and serenity as when you are around Aqsa Mosque. Honestly, even the first thing Zohar said was that there is just, you can just feel something different here. And you're standing there and you know you're just looking at it and you're just kind of reflecting on the difficulties you've just had to get there and just the entire circumstance and there you are subhanallah and you're seeing kids playing around you this is like this little beacon of safety that you know everyone is is kind of milling around and subhanallah it's amazing because when we go to Makkah or Medina where everyone is kind of international tourists right and you don't really feel like there's a, a an indigenous people here who are welcoming you right oftentimes the Saudi these make you feel very unwelcome. But when you go to Palestine, you feel this local welcome like never before. You feel that, you know, the Palestinians are just so happy that you're there. They'll come up and they'll say, where are you from? And then you'll say Australia and they'll be like, Australia? And you'll say, Australia. And then they're like, Australia, they're so happy that you're there. You know, they, they ask you, what do Australians think about Palestine? And then we say, oh, we're with you. And they get so happy. Just this simple act of support. We can't even understand like how much that means to them. And so you're, you know, you're, you're there and it's this beautiful, the adhan starts to, 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 you know, be played. And honestly, this deep, deep tranquility that you feel as you are at Aqsa Mosque is truly undescribable and truly something you have to go and experience, inshallah. 
So as Zahir mentioned, the entire Aqsa mosque complex is quite large, and there's a lot of misconceptions about it. So this entire area is around 144,000 square feet, square meters, and you can kind of think that, you know, Masjid Haram in Mecca is like 356,000 square meters. And obviously Masjid Haram in Mecca covers the entire Haram complex. Similarly, Masjid Aqsa covers the entire Aqsa complex. So it includes the Dome of the Rock that is more towards the center, and Masjid Qibli on one of these sides, as well as many subterranean mosques, large prayer spaces underground, and also these entire courtyard spaces. And it's important to know this because Often there's a lot of misconceptions. People will say, oh, the Dome of the Rock is Masjid Aqsa, or Masjid Qibli is Masjid Aqsa. That's not really Masjid Aqsa. This entire area is Masjid Aqsa. And again, it's part of the Zionist narrative to break up Masjid Aqsa and say that, oh no, the, the courtyard is actually public land. And so there's this act of reclaiming the land where you'll see at prayer times, the masjid is not full yet, but you'll see little groups of Palestinians praying small, in small clusters on the courtyard. And this is again an act of reclaiming the land that this entire area is Masjid Aqsa, this entire area is for Muslims uh, and belonging to Muslims and needs to stay with the Muslims. So this entire area, that whole space is Masjid Aqsa and that is what is referred to as Masjid Aqsa and inside Masjid Aqsa grounds is the Dome of the Rock and Masjid Qibli as well. So going inside Masjid Qibli, so this is the main, uh, main prayer space, right, Masjid Qibli. And one of the first things that you'll notice is how open and welcoming this is. So you go in there and you see this is the sister side on, the, on this side of the screen. And it's not partitioned off for anything. It's just these large um, kind of like open uh, wooden uh, barriers that are loosely placed to loosely demarcate an area for sisters. And subhanAllah, the level of, you know, welcome that you feel as a woman coming into Masjid Aqsa is unparalleled and it honestly is something for us to learn for our masjids i felt so much more welcome in masjid aqsa compared to any masjid in australia you know and subhanallah like when you're going in there women are welcome this is a culture where obviously they are in, they are in such a situation they understand that they need every single muslim to be passionate and engaged with the faith so we don't have time for isolating women in these small little closets and subhanallah some masjids you think that at the end of the day are they thinking they're more holy than Masjid Aqsa when this is the you know kind of in some closet spaces that women have versus how Masjid Aqsa is open and welcoming you'll have many halaqas after prayers you know where you'll have uh, people sitting you'll have women who stand up in the sister side start doing halaqas start doing lectures that level of openness and welcoming we have to think like how do the women in our communities feel in our masjids and learn from Masjid Aqsa inshallah it's a powerful lesson and honestly every single woman in our group was amazed by this and commenting about this on how the vibe and how being in Masjid Aqsa was so powerful and transformative. So next slide. And again, another very incredible thing that you'll see in Masjid Aqsa is these kind of evidence of violence, right? And so again, this is very jarring for us to see that you'll see these cut out bullet holes in the partitions, in the screens. And, you know, even in the, the walls, these stone walls, there's these bullet holes drilled in. And these beautiful stained glass windows, you know, later we spoke to one of the craftsmen. Each of these windows takes three months to create by hand. And this was shattered in Ramadan 2022 on the last time that Israeli soldiers raided Aqsa Mosque. So you see these kind of signs of violence throughout the mosque here. And again, it's just so jarring. And you look at this and say, how is it possible that this open just d d destruction of a place of worship is just being tolerated. I mean, imagine if this kind of, you know, violence was seen in any other place of worship, right? So you go in there and, they, and you'll just kind of see cracks and breaks and bullet holes just from these, like almost telling a timeline of this recent kind of violence in the mosque, subhanAllah. So next slide. Um, and there's a really beautiful uh, culture of generosity in the mosque that is so incredible to see. So this sister who is on the side um, after Fajr in the masjid, she was started like passing out these little uh, kind of rolls of bread with some dates. And so then someone else in our group told us that, you know, she had been previously and this sister every day for the past 10 years has come to the masjid after Fajr with these hand-baked goods to pass them out. 
And just as this act of generosity, it's amazing this hospitality that the Palestinians have. This other sister, again, just giving out bread. This, honestly, the simplicity that they have, yet the generosity that they demonstrate is just so touching. And, you know, you're, you're just amazed by how so many of them have so little, but they give so much, subhanAllah. So, uh, again, you know, we're, we're moving through. So we have, you know, you have this experience in Masjid Qibli, and it's beautiful, and you've experienced the generosity. Then we're going to explore, uh, you know, the Dome of the Rock, that beautiful, iconic structure. And one of the very interesting things that most people don't know about the Dome of the Rock is that this is primarily a women's masjid. This is primarily used for the women's prayer space. So at prayer times, the Dome of the Rock is used for women. Oftentimes men are not allowed to enter because it's full with women. And for Friday, for Jummah, it is exclusively a female space for women to pray. And again, it's this contrast that in many of our mosques, women have the worst place in the mosque, the smallest little corner. And in Masjid Aqsa, they have the most beautiful iconic structure is the women's space. Honestly, it, it was so mind-blowing to see this. And you go in there and there's women and they're teaching these large groups and they're educating and you know they're having these halaqas and circles again the understanding that when Muslim women have greater understanding and feel more welcome in the masjid the entire ummah is elevated so that it, honestly it's beautiful to see this level of female engagement and welcome in Aqsa that again all Western communities and mosques need to learn from subhanAllah so that is in the Dome of the Rock. Beautiful meeting the Palestinians there in Aqsa Mosque. And you know, these, these girls who I was speaking with, again, they just love interacting with visitors, saying, where are you from? They're so amazed that you're coming and visiting. And it means so much to them because they're like, oh, you care about Palestine to come. And so these girls, subhanAllah, one of them, she wants to be an astronaut, Reem in the corner, um, you know, and they have such big dreams. And subhanAllah, one of the challenges is that oftentimes the resources from their families run out. And so it's difficult for, you know, many of these kids to kind of continue pursuing higher education. And they're so bright, they're so smart. And so it's like, honestly, you feel so helpless in a sense because... Like this is an aspect of resources that we need to go there, support them, so that they're able to elevate themselves and fulfill those dreams, inshallah. So um, another very beautiful thing is obviously the inside of the Dome of the Rock, the architecture that you'll see. So this is Sayyaf Sumera. He's one of the architects who focuses on restoration in the dome. And so he was actually up on this crane painting at the top. And so we kind of went up to him and, and did a little impromptu interview. And it was incredible. So he was saying that this, again, this three months it takes to make each stained glass window in Masjid Aqsa. And then in just a second, Israeli soldiers will come in and just shoot the place up, right? and destroy these months of hard work. And it's, he, he's basically preserving this specific art style that is used to repair the, the masjid. And so it's something that he's passing down and he's teaching others to be able to do that because it's a very specific traditional way. And it's actually, a, you know, it's in preserving some of the Ottoman style of the mosque and a very specific artistic way. And so it's beautiful to see him and the passion that he has for Aqsa Mosque. And it's amazing because when you're in the Dome of the Rock, like you realize that every single inch of that building has been covered with the blood of shaheeds from the crusaders, you know, from the massacre at Aqsa Mosque. Like it's, it's just overwhelming to, you know, be in that space and to recognize the history that, you know, the Palestinian people are still protecting and preserving for us. And in addition to, obviously, these two main spaces, there's so many subterranean mosques. So this one on the right is the Marwani Mosque. And again, there's this strong culture of female learning. So you have all of these little halakas that are run by women, taught by women, run by men, teaching women. And so there's like this beautiful, again, this revival of Islam of people learning and educating. This is the Masjid al-Buraq. So you, again, you wind down this subterranean staircase. And there's this like notch in the wall. And so here, it's said that this is the location where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa tied Burakh. But again, we don't know the exact location of any of these sites. It would have been around in this general area, right? The actual dome in the Dome of the Rock is, uh, is, is around this large rock in the center. And so again, it said that, oh, this is the location where the Prophet وسلم, ascended to Isra al Miraj. Again, it would have been in this area. We don't know the exact location, but that is the highest point in that entire area. So you no, know, makes sense. But obviously, we don't know any of the locations of these specific historical incidents. But you're just, again, overwhelmed that this is where these this happened right this 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 happened in history subhanallah so um another thing that's very interesting here is this old library 
And subhanAllah, on these bookcases, stacked up is piles and piles of historical documents that honestly should be in museums. Like you touch them and they're like crumbling in your hands. And this is one of them. So this is draft estimates from the British government from 1942. On the top left corner it says secret and on the top right corner it says Palestine. So this is from the land of Palestine, a list of, re of revenue and expenditures from the British government in carrying out basically their role in Palestine. And so there's that narrative that Palestine never existed. It was a land with no people. I mean, you have in here engineering textbooks. You have these kind of state documents from the British government that show that Palestine was thriving, subhanAllah. And honestly, I was just so amazed like that these are just stacked up in like a tall pile. And we were, you know, looking at them in the library and she came and she was like, what are you guys doing? And we're like, you know, in, in, in our home in Australia, people say that like there never was Palestine. There weren't people here. And she's like, they say that. They do. And you have here these, you know, ancient documents that, you know, really demonstrate a completely different picture. SubhanAllah. So that's the library. Walking through the courtyards is such an experience. And again, the warmth of the Palestinian people just amazes you. So this was on Friday. Zohar was just walking, reciting Surah Kaf. This brother comes to him and says, Salaamu Alaikum. Big hug, kisses him on the cheek. So happy to see you there. And again, to see that revival of Islam and this awareness of Palestine in the Muslim conscience. This is brother, he, subhanAllah, he, he comes up and he says, I was arrested. 10 times and he looks at his and he shows us his face and he's like I don't look too good because of the gas so obviously from numerous gas attacks and Cesar said you look beautiful mashallah and he you know he was again like you're just amazed at these people and the tales that they have and the and what they've gone through and and you're uh, unbelievable that they're you know walking around with this deep level of contentedness that is just subhanallah incredible um, and so around the courtyard as well, you see so many of these beautiful children, these groups of kids. They love coming up, talking to visitors. They love technology. They love seeing you take pictures because technology is how they relay their story to the world, right? Like the explosion of social media is how they've been able to have their stories told. So when we were taking pictures, they come up and they, you know, they just be happy that you're there. And you know, the smiles that you give you is just so beautiful. There's a lot of couples who do their wedding photo shoots at Aqsa Mosque. So you get to see them again in that beautiful joy there's tons of cats all over Masjid Aqsa as well um, you know and then here as well more of these kids honestly you wonder like why why and how are they so happy subhanallah like the difficulties uh, this group of, of girls their older brother is in prison and subhanAllah, their mother, she was talking and she was like in the same conversation. She's saying, thank you for coming. We're so happy you're here. And then she got a bit emotional and she's like, you know, my son is in prison. And then she just kind of regains her composure and she's like, thank you for coming, subhanAllah. And so when you're there with them, you know, you're playing with them and engaging with them, it's, it's unbelievable. And just going there to, to spend time with the Palestinian children is worth that ticket price alone, subhanAllah. And you go there and you're, and you're spending time with them and just your simple presence is just means so much to them. And it's like, honestly, it's very undescribable. And you leave gaining more than what you think, you know, the, that you're, you, you, you've given to them, subhanAllah. So you're going there, interacting with the kids. These girls, they were so beautiful. You know, they would, they, we met them at the beginning of the week. And, you know, the way that, you know, they, they were so happy again to see us. They ran after us saying, I love you. You know, they were just so happy. We ran around with them, played with them, such small things. And they were so delighted that we were there. And, you know, subhanAllah, honestly, the izza of the Palestinian people is so incredible. So on our leaving, on our way out, I tried to kind of give some charity to this family. And they were, they were so offended by this, honestly. And they said, no, we're not people who receive charity. We want you to come and support us. We're not here to get charity. And so you like, you know, honestly, it's like, it's crazy to kind of interact with this level of, of faith and iman and, and izza in these difficult circumstances. This little girl as well, you know, she would be selling just simple things on, this, on the street stall. Her mother is cooking, you know, in a small little street. And then on the last day, you know, we were leaving and I would see her every day. So we would say salam to her. And on the last day, you know, she ran up to me and she like takes off this little golden bracelet and she gives it to me because she wanted to give me a gift, subhanAllah. <laughs> So you see like this level of acceptance and generosity that you learn from the Palestinian people and we have to, 
you know, I really, like, just honestly just admire that and admire their, their tawakkul, their faith, and how, you know, it's such a lesson for us, subhanAllah. Um, you know, in, in addition, like, you're going into the restaurants, the Palestinian people, again, the love that they have. We walk into this restaurant, this man, he sees Zohar, he comes, he brings him over, hugs him, kisses him, sits him down, welcome to the restaurant. And, you know, just the, the way that he's, he's so happy. And then Zohar asked, oh, is the food halal? And he's like, of course it's halal. Like, my family, you know, we've gone for Umrah. This is like a, an aspect that this is, this is what they hold on to the most. Because when you take everything away from a person, like, the things they have left are so, so meaningful. And so his connection to Islam is like, this is something he's so proud of. And so they have that, you know, that pride in their work, their pride in their dignity, in their ethics, in their Islam, you know, and, and again, you, you feel like you're in a different, in a different time, like this, this man, he'd be walking through the street, just saying like, Ya Yuhannas, and like, you know, he's saying hadith on the street, and then Zohar stops and says salam to him, he just gives him so much love, he hugs them, gives him some hadith, gives him some advice, and walks off, you know, carrying his bags on his staff, subhanAllah. Um, again, a really important thing when you're there is to actually go with your tourism dollars and support the Palestinian people. So obviously, you know, when you're going through these shops, uh, you, I went into this one store and this, uh, this brother who I didn't take a picture with, he said, you know, I have this small little store. It's this little corner store tucked away. You know, maybe a few tourist sales is what he hopes for for the day. And he said that for me, they told me, sell your store at whatever price you name your price. And then we will give you a citizenship to Canada, a, f a home for your family, a $50,000 a year job guaranteed. Just sell us your shop and leave. And he said, and I said, no. And I said, well, how, how could you say no to this? And he said, because Palestine is not for sale, and we're here. SubhanAllah. Let's go back again. And subhanAllah, so when you're there, you know, going there and supporting, I actually want to play this video that this, this brother, again, just out, buying in a buy in the store, he said, I want to send a message to your people in the world. And so I just recorded him, subhanAllah, and the way, what he shared, it just perfectly summarizes why we all need to go to Palestine. So SubhanAllah, we're visiting Bethlehem today, and SubhanAllah, this is where you really start to see the uh, lived reality of the occupation and the oppression that the Palestinians go through every single day. So it is a hard reality to see, and it's very sad. Bias here with brother. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Please come in to pray in Al Aqsa. Yes. Don't leave Al Aqsa alone. Absolutely. Don't leave the old city, Palestine, Al Quds alone. When you come in here, you give us message for my children, for my family, for myself, for Muslim people in Al Quds, old city. I am not alone. Please come back to Al Quds. Come in to walk in the old city to say assalamu alaikum. Please, we don't ask about zakah. We don't ask about sadaqah. We need you just to make from us gentlemen to buy my stuff to visit us to pray in Al Quds, mm. to stay, to sleep in the hotel, to eat in the restaurant. This is you give us so much power, you give us so much support, and you make from us gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for you. Inshallah, we will all come again and again and again. Visit Not you, Aqsa. your family, Everyone. your friend, Everyone. your sisters, your Everyone. neighbors, and you tell them how you are with us. We need you to take good picture about yes. Palestine. Yes, I took lots of good pictures. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. So, Mashallah, this brother, you know, he just summarizes it completely. You know why we need to go there, Subhanallah. So. And you know, I, I won't go into too much more of the detail, you know, the rest of the trip. I actually did document all of our experiences going to Bethlehem, seeing some of the settlements, but in the interest of time, I'll skip forward through that. So, and again, there's, there's so much there that you have to go to see, right? There's a graveyard on the outside of Masjid Aqsa, a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. Two companions are buried here, Ubadi ibn Samit, his grave is there. Again, you're just surrounded by history from all these areas of Muslim history. There's the birthplace of Maryam is here as well. It would have been again somewhere in this area. Let's go forward. And there's the Christian site. I'll just kind of uh, move forward through this because again, in the interest of time. So I'll just kind of skip through some of the, uh, some of the slides. I'll stop here though. Go back one. 
So this is kind of something that I really want to, I guess, end on, is that the level of propaganda that you see here is so powerful and was so jarring for us to see. So you're in the Muslim quarter, you're surrounded by all of this love in spite of their circumstances. And then you go into the Israeli area of the old city and it's like you're in a completely different world. You're in these streets that are wide, that is like, you know, a trendy European cafe. And these streets, they're cleaned three or four times a day. The Palestinian, Palestinian areas are cleaned once a week, if that. So you see there's this stark difference in how they live and how they're treated. And obviously this attempt at marginalizing a community at every level of their existence. And throughout Israel, you'll see that there are these, obviously these signs, this, these posters, and there's this constant push to write the narrative, not write Palestine. You will never see the word Palestine mentioned. It says fight terror, support Israel. And so you see this narrative shifting that they need to frame it, that there is terror and there is Israel. And so when you're going there, it's bizarre because you're surrounded by this level of propaganda that's all over that needs to label Islam and Muslims and Palestinians as terrorists to allow this marginalization to happen. And now as kind of there's more awareness about the Palestinian people, about the oppressions that are happening here, now they're becoming more and more urgent and maintaining their control over the narrative because the narrative is starting to crumble and people see the reality as well there so we'll switch to the next one and you know when it, one of the places that you see this is when you go to Bethlehem you know you you start, you exit a little bit out of the tourist areas of Jerusalem literally just 10 kilometers away so subhanallah we we, we, we travel to Bethlehem one of these days if we switch the side and this was our driver and he literally 10 kilometers away from Masjid Aqsa and he said my wife her dream is to visit Masjid Aqsa and she's never been literally 10 kilometers away and you're just amazed by you know that love that they have for fighting for Aqsa and fighting for Palestine and how easy it is for us to go right? we live literally on the other side of the world and it can be faster for us to go and pray there compared to a Palestinian family who lives just in the next neighborhood and so many of them they've never been they long to go but they're just not able to go there's the checkpoints they have to go through or they're not allowed or there's restrictions on them and so you realize what a privilege it is you know and I'll just move through these he showed us some of the areas where his land where his family family's land was that again was stolen by occupation um, you know you'll actually see that uh, you know in many of these homes they have these water canisters on top of their homes because they cut off water and power to these homes again these tactics of oppression that are used and so they have to collect water for those times where the water will be shut off from their homes and then as well you know you'll see the walls there you'll see these huge massive nine foot tall walls three feet deep and you know what Zohar was starting to mention as well is that these walls they cut through the Palestinian areas and they make incursions onto the land to further continue to make the area for Palestinians smaller and smaller they cut through key economic areas and again this this building of these walls are a, a tool of separation as well and uh, this is kind of this critical piece where you see the use of again propaganda so there's this very famous artist, his name is Banksy. And so he has gone through and he's done these paintings on many surfaces in Palestine that are this symbol of kind of peaceful resistance. So here, this is in Bethlehem, and he, there's a symbol of someone who's throwing flowers because, you know, this aspect of peaceful resistance. And this level of, you know, kind of awareness media is so dangerous to the occupation that here you have, they put up posters from, uh, in the Israeli areas that have to call this out. So here they show, they change it, and they show that, you know, they have a, a you know, a person in this traditional Israeli garb, and so he's holding some flowers, and then you have kind of this opposite of it, this gun, the shooting, and they say, oh, that we, we, you know, we see Banksy's art, and we sure we would love to be meeting this resistance with flowers and peace, but the extreme radical Muslim terrorist organizations, they will, they will not change and bombs will come. And we know if we don't respond back with, violent, with, with force, that basically we, our children will be killed and we have full intention to protect our children. And so you see this, honestly, you feel like you're in some strange war movie where this propaganda is twisting the situation and something so simple as a art 
artwork that demonstrates Palestinian people coming in peace, that's what is so feared and needs to be silenced and trampled and redone and posted everywhere in the Israeli areas. But what this also shows is the power of media and awareness and sharing because this is what they're desperately trying to change the narrative around. And we go to the next one again. And again, now when you see these pictures that have this artwork, this viral artwork that starts to indicate the, the, what's actually happening to the Palestinians, encouraging people to learn more about it themselves, that's why this messaging is so desperate. Support Israel now more than ever, right? Now more than ever. Why now more than ever? Because the narrative is changing. And so that is why it's so important for us to go and see it for ourselves and then come back and tell all of our circles, right? This is what's happening. This is what I experienced. This is actually actually how I was, you know, feeling when I was, you know, meeting the Israeli soldiers and seeing the oppression in person and being able to have those discussions. Those real change conversations don't happen online. It happens in person with your boss, with your coworker, with, so, you know, with someone who's just on the fence. And subhanAllah, one of the beautiful things is that we were feeling just so frustrated after seeing all of this. And so we were just kind of going around the old city and, we, you know, we'd see some tourists and we'd go up and talk to them and just kind of see where they're at. And, you you know, this, this uh, old white man and his son, they, they were like, don't tell anyone, but we're on your side. And so there's this level of just people learning more about it, finding out more about it, and then becoming, you know, obvi an obvious ally to the Palestinian people once you realize the level of oppression. And, you know, subhanAllah, just taking it back, like, now whenever, you know, thinking about Palestine, obviously I'm thinking back to those kids who we met and, you know, really praying and child that maybe these efforts of, you know, spreading awareness, talking about it can, inshallah, lead to hopefully a better future for them where, you know, there's the resources and they don't have to go through this level of occupation. SubhanAllah, Sheikh Samer, his children, they go to university in, in you know, in Nablus and the level of that they have to cross through all of these checkpoints along the way. No student can imagine that life, but that's the everyday reality for the Palestinian people, SubhanAllah. So to conclude, may Allah liberate Palestine and allow us all to visit Masjid Aqsa and see and support the Palestinian people. Again, really make that intention that when you go for Umrah, go and take those tourism dollars and support the Palestinians, not only with financially, but mentally, emotionally, and show them that the Ummah is there, SubhanAllah. Um, and Charles Zahra can come up and, and do a dua. <laughs> Okay, cool. <laughs> that's the, okay, I thought you wanted to do a dua. Okay, but obviously, yeah, so that's the, that's, you know, kind of the biggest thing. As you're going through there, and, you know, the Palestinians, they'll say, you know, inshallah, they have such strong conviction that, you know, they're going to see liberation soon. And that was one of the most amazing things for me that I felt kind of was a transformation the way I thought about Palestine is that I was always feeling sad and frustrated about the situation. But going and seeing their hope and their optimism and their strong tawakkul that Allah will answer our duas and liberate Palestine, like I actually started feeling like excited to see this liberation happen, inshallah. And, and you know, it's, it's really like, they're the ones in the oppression and the occupation, and they're the ones who are inspiring us to have that continued hope and optimism and continuing to make dua. So yes, so even before your Palestine trip, inshallah, remembering the Palestinian people in your duas frequently and often, and asking Allah sincerely for their, for their safety, for their security, and for liberation, inshallah. So Jazakallah Khair for listening. Thank you so much. I'm very excited for our next section with, uh, you know, with our interview, and so inshallah, we'll continue from there. Jazakallah Amina, that was really moving. Um, I can see from the faces in the audience that through both of your presentations, we have all become leaves on the tree that is Palestine. Um, we are not done with the program yet, so we still have an interview with Dr. Muntasir, who is a cardiologist. Um, he studied in Jerusalem during the first intifada. But before that, we just have a little bit more insight into Amina and Dr. Zuhair's trip. They have recorded some videos, which we'll play now, just give you a small glimpse into the beauty of Palestine and the strength of its people.
you visualize it from a scale model. From the courtyard, the two main French spaces are mustard quibbly on this side, and on this side, we have the iconic Dome de Rock. But first, let's explore the main prayer space, Masjid Qibli. Masjid Qibli was the first mosque established in Aqsa by Umar ibn al-Khattab. Here you can actually see the original mihrab of Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, the famous historical liberator of Jerusalem. This is almost 900 years old. The beautiful stained glass windows are so ornate, but sadly many of them have been broken, damaged, and destroyed by Israeli attacks. You can see many of the windows are busted, shattered in from the Ramadan 2022 attacks on Aqsa Mosque. Even on the screen partitions in the sister section, you can see bullet holes inside them from, again, the attacks, even up here. So one thing you'll notice is that Aqsa Mosque is extremely open for women. So this is the women's section, and it's not fenced off or anything. There's just these kind of loose partitions. Despite the situation, Masjid Qibli is one of the most peaceful and serene spaces you will have the pleasure of praying in for both men and women. There's also a hidden library under Masjid Qibli. You'll pass by ancient Roman pillars that take you straight back in time. I found these old documents. These are from the British government during the colonization of Palestine. This is from 1942 and 19 documents that show 1942 the land was Palestine. The library has many more historical documents you'll have to discover for yourself. Now let's explore the Dome of the Rock. This is the oldest surviving Islamic architecture in the world today. The octagon base is marble and the blue colored tile mosaic features an inscription of Surah Yasin. Inside the golden dome is inscribed Ayatul Kursi. Inside the Dome of the Rock you have the beautiful interior of the golden dome and this mosque is shaped like a circle around the original rock here. Remember this is on a hill. So this is the original rock in the center of the mosque. It's said that this is the location where the Prophet ascended for Isra al Miraj, but there's really no evidence to suggest that this is the exact location. We just don't know. Visiting the dome, we were able to speak to Sayyid Sumira, a master craftsman specializing in the art of dome restoration. the Dome of the Rock is an architectural masterpiece that the Palestinians care for, protect, and preserve. Surrounding both mosques and the entire courtyard are these ancient city walls. You really get a sense of being transported back in time. So this is actually the key to King Faisal Gate, taking us behind the scenes with Sheikh Samer, one of the Palestinian guards of Aqsa Mosque. The mosque courtyards also have an important function. These are overflow prayer spaces, places for kids to play in safety, and of course, meeting places for a sense of belonging that the Palestinian people so need. Every day you'll see new Palestinian couples getting married in Aqsa. Outside the eastern wall is the Baba Rahma Cemetery, 1400 years old and two companions of the Prophet وسلم, are actually buried here. There's also many tertiary smaller mosques all over the complex. This is the subterranean Masjid al bura Wind down a narrow staircase and you'll find yourself in a small prayer room. There is a marker on the wall in which it is said that this is the location where the Prophet وسلم, tied Burak, a miraculous mysterious creature, before ascending to heaven during Isra al Miraj. Next we explored Marwani Mosque, which is another prayer space in Aqsa that is popular for knowledge circles and students to learn. One of the beautiful things you see in Palestine is the legacy of female scholarship. If you look at the halakhas, all women, all the time. This is another group of all women. I hope this behind the scenes tour gave you just a small taste of the many secrets of Al-Aqsa. You'll have to go there yourself to find the rest. So as you can see, Al-Aqsa is such a beautiful mosque with deep history. So I hope you come and walk here for yourself. 
It's such a privilege. So many Palestinian families who live nearby have never been able to visit Al-Aqsa because of the Israeli occupation. So never forget this blessed place in your du'as. The way that Allah describes this place is, is, is overwhelming. We are at the core of that blessing. Sham in the general sense, and then Palestine in the more specific sense. Beitul Maqdis, Quds, and then Aqsa. and the oppression that the Palestinians go through every single day. It's very sad. Alright, so catching a bus to Bethlehem. <laughs> so this is at the checkpoint in Bethlehem. And just simple things like taking your bicycle to the checkpoint. You can see how difficult this is. So we just hopped into a cab in Bethlehem and the taxi driver was showing um, this video. This is like in the morning, the amount of Palestinians who are at the checkpoint waiting to go through to work. SubhanAllah, you see here the massive apartheid wall separating Palestinians from Israel. This is a 100 kilometer massive wall all the way up and it really gives you a sense of that open-air prison. And just like in any wartime situation, how do people express their freedom? Through art. So you see Free Palestine, this one. And especially here after visiting Bethlehem, you see the way the Palestinians live, the restrictions, the difficulties, their homes being taken from them. Then you see this wall, it just is so moving, subhanAllah. So this systematic propaganda is throughout this area, right? So even in terms of entering Bethlehem, so you can see for yourself how the Palestinians live, there's signs that say this is a dangerous area. So tourists do not come here. So again, it's just the way the whole area is set up is to keep Palestinians isolated and away from exposure to the rest of the world. So it's such a moment to reflect on our privilege because we've come from across the world, easily going into Jerusalem, visiting Masjid al-Aqsa, loving it. And subhanAllah, our driver, he for 30 years, he has not been able to go visit Masjid al-Aqsa because of the difficulty, getting permission, the cost, the, the, the how long it takes for Palestinians to actually travel there. And so his family has been asking, they want to go see Jerusalem, they want us to go see Masjid al-Aqsa, it's their dream, the kids want to go and they're not able to, subhanAllah. My wife is never he's my dream he's, she's tell me please take me to Al-Aqsa I tell him I cannot just imagine that for some people living in the UK it might be faster for you to come from the UK and pray in Masjid Aqsa than a Palestinian family living nearby to come and pray in Masjid Aqsa 10, 10 kilometers away from literally 10 kilometers away so here in Bethlehem you see a really great example of the settlements in action and here the water supply has been cut off so if you look at the houses Every single house has like canisters of water on the roof. So that's for water storage because water supply has been cut off to these homes. So right here you can see this large settlement out the window. And this is basically what it used to be. All of the trees were raised and became this uh, settlement. So we're actually driving up this mountain and this is the location of where this gentleman's family lived prior to settlement. But when water was cut off, the area became so unlivable for Palestinian families, so you moved out, right? Exactly. You see, my village before all this the settlement, this is the settlement, and this is the settlement, and this is the settlement. This occupation, our land, all the land is for the farmer, for working the farmer. His, this is all your farmland yes, before, the yeah. Yes, the land is family, is occupations. And the electrics is no electrics. Waters is not your, uh, the waters. My village before all this the settlement. You have the waters, you have the electrics, you have everything. Looking at the, the fence, okay, make the, the, the zoom for the camera. Looking at the tree in the side of the fence, looking at all yeah, the tree look at that. is Do you dead. see the difference? Yes, that's yes, is because of the water. That is the humanity oh, what wow. we're talking about that. So we've come up this mountain here and you get this beautiful view over the mountains. This is prime farming land. Of course, the Palestinian people who lived here were farmers. But this is also the location of a settlement. So you can see here, the settlers came forced the Palestinian people out of their homes, took over and occupied this land. And the tactics that you'll see here that were used for occupation are so terrible. Water being cut off from homes, and that means the food supply for Palestinians is gone because farmers can't grow their crops without the water. So you can actually see, if you just look here, that the areas that are lush and green are the Israeli settler locations. And then the dry, barren, destroyed lands is now what's left for the Palestinians. 
so in so this is just systematic ways to force the, the Palestinian people out and how you marginalize a community. He cuts everything. So he cuts for the food for Palestinians. So it's not only the cut, the waters and the electric. Sometimes the army is coming in the night and, and he's shooting with our life. You, you cannot see that in the city. That is my life. Mm. This is my life. So in Bethlehem, this is one of Banksy's famous graffiti pieces. So Banksy was a British artist who felt very strongly about, you know, Palestine. And so he would come and do these incredible murals, which are like a symbol of peace now. So this guy is throwing flowers. And this is a real indication of what is the thing that is the most harmful for the occupation, media and people speaking out. So what Banksy is doing is it's creating awareness, conversation. Then people are going, learning, researching, oh, this is what's really happening happening in Palestine and so to counter this because the Israeli occupation doesn't want people to find out what's happening they put up propaganda posters again dehumanizing the Palestinians labeling them as terrorists to remove the people actually coming and learning and seeing for their own eyes the difficult reality that the Palestinians live every single day so that's why it's really important to come and hear and see but it has a sniper target on it. So thought-provoking, get people to actually look and learn about the situation in Palestine. So we're just walking through the old streets towards the Church of Nativity where Christians believe that Jesus was born. And it's important to know that the Christians living here suffer the same persecution that the Palestinian Muslims are facing. So this is definitely like Palestinians in general, Muslims and Christians are experiencing And there's this. a significant Christian population here. Yes, so Bethlehem is, Muslim. yeah, 60% Muslim, 40% Christian. Christian here, very good relations here, no problems there. Yeah. And again, both victims of the occupation. So they were very, very kind in the church. You would hear some of the guides saying that we have to learn about each other's religions to establish commonality you'll find that there's that strong allyship between Christians and Muslims in Palestine so right here you'll also see a huge painting honoring Shireen who was killed recently Subhanallah her family was from Bethlehem another section of the wall walls are meant for climbing there's other ones that says make anything just not walls and just see how this is such a symbol of separating the Palestinians isolating them keeping them away from the rest of the world and it's media and talking and spreading the word that is what is helping break down the walls metaphorically that are keeping the Palestinians in this situation so we're just crossing the checkpoint to leave and subhanallah you see um people like coming in after work um, and they're just coming into the walls and it's like they're just coming back into their prison and so it's really hard to see subhanallah and so it just you know it really just shows that we have to kind of keep talking about it because like it matters that amazed me most here was the legacy of female scholarship. After every single prayer, you'll see women stand up and start doing lectures in the mosque. And as you start exploring in the different passages underneath the mosque, you'll see that there's so many classes, all female classes, learning from both male and female speakers. And you know, sometimes Western Muslims, we like to think that we're more advanced than the rest of the world. But when you look at here in Palestine, in Malaysia, in so many Muslim countries, females teaching and learning is so normal. I was surprised that like a lot of the uh, Halifax you'll see are like mostly women. Why are you surprised? Muslim culture, actual orthodox, I normative Islam completely relies on. Yeah, and you know, and I know, modern Dahawa, if I'm doing a class, 70% of them are women. Right. Always have them. Yeah. That's the normative the reality of modern Islam. So it's about reconnecting with the legacy of scholarship, you know, in the spirit of Aisha Radulanha, Um Salama Radulanha. Female scholarship has always been a big part of Islam since the beginning. Knowledge is power, knowledge is empowerment. The legacy of learning, and scholarship as women. That's a lesson you see here in Aqsa in Palestine. Alhamdulillah. Um, Jazakallah for those videos. Um, I would like to wholeheartedly thank Amina and Dr. Zuhair for sharing your personal experiences with us. This has solidified more than ever the need for people to visit Palestine, travel there, visit the people, play with the children, let them know that we have not forgotten.
uh, is the occupation is trying to limit your movement, trying to arrest you, you're fearing for your parents, whether they're getting arrested or shot dead. You know a story of someone who lost, and I'm no different to anybody else. So I grew up there, and we used to go to the school, and we used to have shooting every day around us. Allahu Akbar. Uh, Not to age you, but uh, what year around uh, that you were growing up? So that, well, that was when we moved to Palestine, it was 1986, back from, from uh, the Gulf States. And at that time, two years later, in 1987, the first Intifada started. Mm. And it was, as I said, it's on a daily basis. People here can plan, think about holidays, think about the children going to the play areas. I think the, the common games that people play there, there is that the, you play as the Palestinian fida'i and the Israeli soldier. SubhanAllah. Or the other things you see the kids are playing, that they're carrying one of them as the shaheed. So, oh, Allah, so these, these are, are Palestinian kids. Yeah, these so are their the, version of cops and robbers. Yeah, these, these are the things that the games that people play. And then this is how you grow and you persevere. And uh, with time, it developed that these children are no longer afraid of the occupation. They just mm. they more attached, and they they want to to live their dream, and they won't let anyone stop them. And, and alhamdulillah, that has been part a big part of that. And as I said, I'm, for me, I was shot when I was 12 years old. Subhanallah. So tell us about this. I mean, this is one of the most incredible stories I've heard. Uh, so when you were 12, what happened? So I was walking back from school with my brother and his friend. It's, it's our daily trip. And as I said, there will be shooting here and there. But uh, we were trying to cross the road. And there was one Israeli soldier. They're taking a uh, point on top of one of the buildings. And as we were trying to cross the road, then they, they aimed at me and shot. And I didn't realize until I just moved back and put my hand. And there's blood there. And I told my brother that I, I think I'm shot now. And then we were rushed to a civilian. We rushed to a civilian car, which took us to the hospital. And at that point in my mind, I said, I probably won't survive. SubhanAllah. And my parents rushed from different places. They were like at, at a family, visiting family. And then my grandmother who was elderly at that time. She came rushing. And then in that hospital, we're like, as I said, you don't really know what's happening. because It's too much of a shock for you. And uh, you're trying to grasp that and think about, about too many things going through your head. Can we change the uh, Sorry. battery? Sorry. We'll just change this. What a time to change, right? Right on the cliffhanger. <laughs> That's all right. SubhanAllah. Give you that one. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Yeah. So at that point, basically, I was rushed to the hospital and I couldn't move my arm. So I was talking to them and I said, probably you may, we are afraid. I said, no, I didn't get a chance to be afraid. <laughs> I just, so they took the, the x-ray and they realized that the bullet is still actually in my shoulder. So they transferred, they gave me blood and transferred me to Ramallah Hospital because Tul Karim is a small city. Mm. There is no neurosurgery on site. And that's one of the reasons why I decided to do medicine. That was one of your inspirations. It was one of my reasons why the authorities, so I was transferred in an ambulance. And as soon as we, they woke, wheeled me into the emergency in Ramallah Hospital, uh, there was a, uh, uh, a shaheed brought in. He actually at that time was still being resuscitated. A 17-year-old uh, boy from uh, Der Sudan is in a village near Ramallah mm. who was shot two bullets in the heart. So they're doing CPR next to me. I'm half awake and I don't know whether I will survive or not. So this is just part of how the, the childhood and part of it. And funny enough, when I was sent back to Tul Karim Hospital, one of the guys who was with us in the hospital saw me two months later and said, I thought you were a shaheed. I said, no, it wasn't. SubhanAllah. <laughs> I wasn't lucky enough. He said, oh, but the local news agency announced it. I said, they're not always accurate. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Those, those the origin of fake news, hey? They yeah, oh, Alhamdulillah, it took six months for my arm to, to regain yes. power. Yes, subhanAllah. And um, subhanAllah, I became a cardiologist doing very fine procedures. That's the amazing thing, isn't it? Wires, and it's all the blessing and of Allah. And where is the bullet now? It's still in my shoulder. It's so every time I apply for immigration, I have to do a chest x-ray. It always shows, and I have to explain what that is. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a bullet. But SubhanAllah. I mean, if you think about it, it's just incredible. Because at the beginning, you couldn't, the arm was paralyzed. No, it took six months because the surgeon decided that taking it because it's now exploded. They use these anti-personnel bullets, which are normally not, shouldn't be used. They're not legal to be used internationally but it may it's aimed to cause as much damage as possible so it hit the bone and then spread like and still as i said yeah. it was too risky to do that and for those who don't know there's a, a bundle of, of nerves right here called the brachial plexus and they supply innervate sensory and motor to that entire arm so that shrapnel is 
subhanallah, qadr Allah, that, that it, it was not in the wrong places. Yeah. You're now with the exact same arm, the exact same nervous system, saving thousands of people's uh, lives, subhanallah, in a world, in a land far, far away, Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah, and two days after I was shot, one of my classmates was shot. So he's brought to the same hospital, and he's now a surgeon in the same city. So why were they shooting these children? Was there a reason? Was it just... Well, to be honest with you, they always keep quoting self-defense, because, but how can small kids, there were kids throwing stones at them, but how can kids, small children, throwing stones at an army which is fully equipped with the latest equipment and gear to protect their bodies, and on top of a two-story building, how much risk is a stone is going to cause to these people? But I think it's just trying to kill that... Uh, the, the, the spirit of the Palestinians, because they want these people to move out of the land. Because that's the, where the, the lie that was started initially, that this was a land without people. But they found people who were not budge, people who will stay there, die there, and they're happy to fight and, and lose their Allah lives Allah there. That's, that's been the problem with, with this. Subhanallah. Side. So, uh, subhanAllah, you know, a bit about your childhood, um, you know, and how growing up there, uh, going to, to Palestine in 86, right at the time of the Intifada, which we spoke about in the history. Um, you've had this experience that happened to you. How did that affect you going on in terms of your spirit and your will, like now processing it? You said at the time when they said, were you afraid? You said, I don't have time to even be afraid. In the uh, tell us a bit about the aftermath of that event. Well, well, the aftermath is now I had to put up with, with an injury that's caused me to become partially disabled for six months. I used to go into the classroom where I'm trying to write using both hands. Is this your right hand yeah, as well? because this is my right hand, oh, and oh, trying oh. to do the physiotherapy and try to recover, but also concerned about the future. And also, you know, I had to still pass in front of that point to the school again. <laughs> so Same going spot. Back, yeah, I have to go back to the school. And again, there used to be a settler who used to build a settlement near Tul Karim. That it's area. Called, yeah, it's called in a village called Shufi. He used to pass every morning, start shooting out from the, the, the he's got the two know. people with him shooting from their four-wheel drive so cars. You had to keep going through that yeah. same Yeah, so I had to push through, and when I visited Palestine four years ago with my children, I took them and I showed them where exactly I was shot. Subhanallah. So that, that is the spot where I Allahu bled Allahu and, and I had and survived wow. this, this assault. And as, as all of us, we, we, we always think about the future and trying to be optimistic, and that's why I, th I wanted to become a doctor, I want to, to be able to help and, and do things. Mm. But subhanAllah, then you take your journey in life and try and move forward. So you mentioned earlier, I want to go a little bit into your ancestry a bit, because you mentioned that you moved there from the Gulf back to Palestine. Yes. From your parents or your grandparents, are there any stories during the Nakba or in whatnot? Yeah. Because obviously if they were out, it means that they were forced out yes. in that earlier period. Th there were. My family all is in Tul Karim area and around, which, you, which wasn't affected by the 1948. So they, were not, they didn't become refugees. But now we have different categories of Palestinian refugees. Yeah. Each one comes with a war, then there is another own story. wave of people becoming refugees. So they were pushed out of Palestine uh, in 1967. Right. And that's why, but they had to travel and they had to stay in the fields for two, three days while traveling to Jordan, mm. where they were, my grandmother, late grandmother, uh, may Allah give her Allah rahmah, that she taught, used to tell us the story, how uh, they were walking in those fields and the problem at that time, they felt betrayed because they were told uh, by a lot of the neighboring Arab countries and Muslim countries that they will be supported and it's going to be a matter of time, but it was part of the United Nations where they encouraged people to leave, thinking, oh, the war is going to be over and you're going to be back to your houses. And alhamdulillah, they went back to their houses, but the families have been torn and we have a lot of Palestinians now in the diaspora mm. because of the difficulty of having the whole family in one place and because the economy has been under occupation for so long. So a lot of the Palestinian families rely on relatives who are working overseas, be it in the Gulf countries or being in, in the rest of the world, so Europe yeah. or the America or Australia. Mm, okay. So that's what the made the Palesti forced the Palestinians to form that network where you have the people who are on the ground trying to hold to the land as much as they can and people who need to support them. And that's why I mean, I, I commend you and, and sister for your magnificent efforts you've been and you've visited the places, some parts of the, of the Al-Aqsa Mosque I didn't get a chance to see. And that's just heartbreaking, isn't yeah. it? SubhanAllah. It is. And you were it saying is. that uh, you went with your family in 2018 uh, and you weren't able to actually go no, to No, I Al wasn't allowed. I am a, I was a British citizen. I'm a British citizen as well, an Australian citizen. And the funny thing is that I can't 
act as, a, as an, an, a, an Australian or a, a British there. So I had to travel through Jordan, which makes it a very laborious trip. And then even then, we were not given any permissions to visit into the Basin, so I couldn't go. And I'll tell you when we come to talk about uh, my Inshallah. medical school time. Yes, how uh, well I want to get there now, actually. Yeah. So you're growing up in your you know, adolescence, you're in this environment with settlements that are so close to you. You're going to school in high school. Alhamdulillah, you're accepted into Al-Quds University Medical School. And I think this, you were the first batch, is that correct? We are, so that's another story. So basically, at that time, I wanted to do medicine. and. In, in Palestine, because of how the economy is difficult and everything, education is very important. For each family, it's, um, they invest a lot to make sure that all their children, boys and girls, they go into, uh, into all the, the, the higher education and do degrees and, and, and not stop just at the year 12. Mm. So for us, this was a big, big issue. So there was no medical school, and a lot of people before us who wanted to study medicine have to go overseas. At that time, I didn't want to go overseas. So you have to go to either the uh, Iraq, Jordan, Syria, or to Russia, and other countries, India. But for us, and then SubhanAllah, at that time, the medical school suddenly announced that there is, they, they opened it by our act late uh, uh, Professor Nael Shahabi, who passed away three days ago, sadly. Oh, at the in, yeah, in really? his, in, yeah. So he basically, a great effort because he comes from Jerusalem itself from one of the bigger families in Jerusalem and he established the medical school and it was only him and 34 students at that time who joined and then we had the interviews and alhamdulillah I was lucky to be one and of them. And where did he train because obviously so he trained in Egypt for his first degree and then he did all his uh, postgrad training in the UK okay, so yeah. he's coming from UK trained and now he's coming and establishing. He went first to Jordan. Yeah. He was part of the medical school there. Yeah. And then he came to Palestine with a lot of determination, thinking that we need to train Allah. people here. Allah. We have a lot of need. He was a cardiothoracic surgeon, but he was the old style cardiothoracic surgeon. He can literally fix anything. <laughs> 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 he nothing would stop him. Not no, the sure old days, oh, I only work on this, I only work <laughs> on that. He was fully trained. And I joined him once as a medical student when I was in the year five. Year five for an operation, which was a redo uh, procedure, which took around 11 hours. I said, if I didn't go that far, I may change my mind about going to medicine. <laughs> <laughs> Did he inspire you at all to specialize in cardiology? Because obviously, yes. cardiothoracics, your interventional I, cardiology. Indeed, his knowledge was magnificent. His, his dedication, the way he would deliver things, the way he would teach was phenomenal. But again, it's that kind of feeling, that kind of patriotism, because he were th was there treating all those people who are injured with massive injuries to the chest. As I said, he would operate. If it's anywhere in the blood vessels, he will be happy to work, and he will not stop. And he, subhanAllah, so if he was in UK, he could have had a very comfortable life there. Absolutely. And he, he was high-powered cardiothoracic surgeon, but decides to come and to open up in Al-Quds, like the center of it all, a medical school that can train Palestinian people because a lot of people don't have the resources and the mm. money to be able to go to these places as well outside. Uh, absolutely, and the thing is also that the challenges that were there with the occupation was putting it. I'll give you an example. To do a, a medicine, you have to practice on cadavers, on yep. anatomy. In Muslim culture, people don't donate bodies, so you have to import them from outside. But Israel will not let a single body be imported from any country. SubhanAllah. So we were faced with that challenge. And also for us, we, the medical school was only one room. It's called 206 <laughs> in, in the College of Science and Technology. There was one no room. medical school. Yeah, one room. So the lecturers will come and go. And then the, th the challenge started is that you need now to get professors from outside. You need to get cadavers, and we couldn't. So we were basically, initially, we used blastinated models and yeah. computers. And then uh, whenever somebody comes for autopsy, these are the forensics then we will wait and then oh. do, the, uh, do some of the work on the forensic body. So it's a lot of challenge. And no one before you to guide you, yes, these are the notes you need to be taking. This is what you need to be preparing. But he was very, like, very, all of us and him. Because a lot of people were doubting us. They said, oh, but how do you know that the medical school is going to last? And actually, there are five or six people who left to other medical schools initially, thinking, oh, because this is not going to work. Uh, where are you going to train? The Israelis are going to stop the movement. So the challenges were enormous. And we said, no, we're pressing ahead. And we got some professors from overseas who came and, and, uh, and helped. And it was a nice journey with, with them. Now I feel guilty for sti sticking my hand in that. So, SubhanAllah, tell us a bit about college life in Al-Quds. You're moving, obviously, uh, from the village. And now you're staying in the dormitories there. Yes. Tell us a little bit about college life in Al-Quds University. 
Yeah, so that was also a very um, interesting list to say because we had two kinds. We either rent flats outside the dormitories like here or the, the main university dormitory used to be mainly for the students from Gaza who if they're found out that they're in the West Bank, most of them will be arrested and transferred. Uh, and the rest will be the ones that the Israelis are after them, basically. They're wanted for, for them. Whereas in, our, in the outside, we will have the Israeli army raid our flats at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. in the morning to come and terrorize us. And then they'll take a photo of you holding your ID number and try to interrogate you at any time. So just to make you feel unsafe that they're there. And they raided the student dormitory in... Uh, I think either in 1996 or, or the year after, and they transferred all our colleagues, including one of my dear friends, Dr. Jihad Hamad, who's now the vice dean of the Islamic, uh, of the medical school at the Islamic University in Gaza. So they took him back to Gaza, and we spent a whole year trying to do the education across that. And oh then wow. he, had, he was brought back from Gaza to, to the West Bank, smuggled as a Palestinian officer. In oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the only way to get him across. And then he was taken again back after three, four years. He graduated the last year again in Gaza with Dr. Uh, Professor Na'al Shahabi contributed a lot to make it a success. And Alhamdulillah, he, he graduated. And on the day of graduation, because he was in Gaza, actually, I had to fo have a, 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 a label with his name written on it. Oh next, my God. next to me, so just it was just showing how much they're trying to divide West Bank and Gaza yes. and try to break the spirit of people. But Alhamdulillah, he graduated and he made an I excellent mean, you professor. You talk about the spirit of the Palestinian people. I can imagine going through medical school in a very coachy kind of way, right? I mean, Subhanallah, it itself, the knowledge is already so challenging and difficult to actually master that. To do that in the context that you did it is honestly incredibly inspiring, and I think it speaks to the spirit of the Palestinian people, and I think that that spirit is endowed none but, uh, endowed by none but Allah, because the, the spirit of the Palestinian people is something that is, uh, is, is unmatched and unparalleled throughout the entire world. If you look at the world, and what countries have done to try and destroy the native populations. At the end of the day, everyone has relented. The only exception to that rule in the entire world is the Palestinian people. And subhanAllah, I just want to say that it's incredibly inspiring knowing how you had to learn medicine in, in that type of environment. And it raged you at 2, 3 in the morning, uh, which is incredible. But you were telling me once... Um, that uh, you know, joke was on them because you guys were already awake studying anyway. We right? were, <laughs> indeed, because there's always someone awake. So whenever <laughs> they came, I don't, can't remember any time that they were surprising us because someone is at 3 a.m., someone wakes up at 4 a.m. Yeah, <laughs> so someone Allah. always. And uh, after that, we came to the later two, last two years where the second intifada kicked in. So this is now 2000 and whatnot. You're now an intern. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you finish your medical school training. No, this is even the last year. Oh, we last were, year because we, our school. program was seven years. Seven because Professor years. Shabi himself wanted us to do a long program. Got it. And also to allow us to have a lot of, a lot of uh, science at the basic. Subhanallah. And, also and to you're the first, you were the first batch that went through. Yes, Yasser Arafat invited us at that time to oh. his compound. And it was oh, on, wow. the, on the Palestinian TV. Because this was a big achievement yes. for people to graduate in Palestine. Fully trained there. We, we actually ended up graduating as 21 out of the 30 something. So 21 made it through. Yes. That, that's pretty good percentage. I mean, in medical school here, you get like a drop off of 20, 30, 40 percent. So there was a part so of it because of the challenge, because there's an uncertainty. A lot yeah. of people saying, oh, there's nothing in front What's of it me. What's it going to lead to? Yeah. yeah. So you and had then that. They lost so sorry, sorry, but I have a question for you in that regard. Why did you stay? I mean, obviously these whispers are going to go into your head about future and whatnot. What made you yep. say, I'm going to stick Well, I was passionate because I knew we, were, we will go through. That's what, mm. and, and also, as I said, working closely with my colleagues. All yeah. of us had that fighting spirit together. SubhanAllah. And, uh, and to me, as I said, I'm, I was living on the extra time because I was supposed to be a shaheed <laughs> many years before. <laughs> so so that was a little time, bit yeah, yeah. Like I knew that we're time. not going to uh, give up, alhamdulillah. Allah, Allah, Allah. And in the last year, it became very challenging The last because of the intifada stuff. And the second intifada was much more aggressive because the Israelis were using heavy uh, like F-16s, Apaches, and a lot of more heavy uh, tanks and everything around. So being in the hospital at that time, and funny enough, I worked as an intern in the same hospital I was taken to when I was a kid. Oh, wow. So you were in the same hospital? Yeah, the teaching hospitals are in East Jerusalem. And yeah. in the last two years, it became very difficult with the wall to get through. I remember going to my final exams. You have to be smuggled through a, a, the back of a van. 
If you, and you're worried about passing your exam, but also you're worried about being caught yeah, because oh, you'll have to miss the year and then now be delayed. Yeah, so that was part of the challenge. But then worked as an intern in the uh, governmental hospital in Tul Karim. And the situation was very dire at that time. You'll get people brought with massive injuries, with, with things that you won't be able to cope with normally. SubhanAllah, if there, with the trauma and these sorts of things, that um, you know, if you had to transfer them to a more specialist center, uh, people were dying along the way, is this correct? There was. Yeah. It was a danger, and I can't remember at that time, we had two ambulance crews which were killed within 20 minutes of each other. The first one came and was shot completely, uh, all of the uh, crew, and then the second one came and the driver of the second ambulance was shot. And I had to go with one transfer when the F-16s bombarded the Palestinian police compound to transfer a patient who was bleeding on the brain from Nablus, Tul Karim to Nablus. We were stopped, taken out of the uh, ambulance, and you had to be searched, and then they'll keep pointing at you, keep asking you, and you say, look, this guy is going to die. And they're asking you, oh, where the, which faction he belongs to, this and that. They know they're wasting time so that he gets as much damage as possible. So this was part of the torture that you also were facing. And as a medical staff there or nursing staff or anything, you are under threat because they can shoot you at any time. And to them, it's easy. They'll say, oh, they're smuggling terrorists in the ambulances or whatever. That's the accusations they were using. SubhanAllah. So you finish and you graduate uh, from Al-Quds. You've done your intern year now. Uh, what's next for you just on your medical journey? Just give us a brief kind so of synopsis. I went, uh, I went in to specialize because that's another challenge in Palestine. There is no specialization except in a limited number of fields. It's basically in four major fields. And again, there's lots of difficulties surrounding where you go from here because the, unfortunately, Palestine is not a state on the World Health Organization list. So we had now to fight for the world to recognize our medical degree to allow us to do the exams, whether it's British, Australian, Canadian, or Australia, like the whole over the world. And then okay. it took a while, like took a year almost for them to recognize and allow us to sit the exams. So I went to the UK, I uh, uh, trained in, in cardiology, uh, specialized, I did first general medicine and got my membership and I got a PhD and did my, all my cardiology training over there. Yeah. You've it got a lot of alphabets next to your name, mashallah, tabarakallah. I think there's like, <laughs> like 10 or 12, just like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, L, P, like subhanAllah, Allahu Akbar, many fellowships, many degrees, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. But you know, subhanAllah, it just speaks to that will and that persistence, uh, that spirit that you obviously gained in your formative years in Palestine, growing up with your family and being instilled with that type of spirit, subhanAllah, the success that then you got and subhanAllah as well, look at this and I want to highlight this to the audience as well. He sacrificed fi sabilillah. You would have been easily able to leave Palestine and go to another country. The uncertainty you faced in this degree even meaning something because you cared about the Palestinian land. And subhanAllah, Allah then compensated in this regard. Alhamdulillah, Oxford coming to Australia and these sorts of things. Alhamdulillah, you give something up for the sake of Allah and the sacrifices, Allah makes things easy for you. Jazakallah khair. I mean what you're doing today is, is, uh, is a, a very great help to us because as Palestinians, you see, sometimes it feels lonely. It feels the world is busy with lots of conflicts, lots of things. And like any, I, I always look at it as a chronic illness. When somebody has an acute illness, they're very worried and the visitors and people around them, they always come to see them. But once we have a chronic illness, then people stop worrying about that. And that's what sometimes it looks like. And when people like yourselves who think about Palestine, who visit Palestine and try to show that solidarity makes a lot of difference. And for us, as I said, some of us, alhamdulillah, stayed in Palestine and worked as a specialist there. Some of us are outside. And alhamdulillah, we're now formed an organization called the BANSMA, which is the Palestinian uh, Australian New Zealand Medical Association, which I'm the vice president of. And the aim of, us, of this is to try and now raise funds and start directing some medical help will sometimes get some of us to go down there and do certain procedures that are not available in certain areas sometimes funding doctors from the west bank who can go to gaza and do some of the of the procedures and also to fund some of the urgent medical supplies so i think we all try and do uh, our part and help in in it's one way or the other but we all feel guilty because we all want to be there physically and work there but there are some of the hurdles which are not really good for to discuss in, in today's yes, meeting. But I think, inshallah, 
Uh, I encourage everyone, and uh, may Allah reward you in abundance for, for all this and showing us things. Because when I was in, in studying in Jerusalem, we had three small villages around Jerusalem called Abu Dis, al and Sawahri, which are only uh, two kilometers away or three kilometers away from the Al-Aqsa Mosque. But we were not always able to get there. It's always a challenge for us. But Alhamdulillah, you visited and you could go everywhere and see everywhere. And inshallah, we one day it will be all free and we all can go there ameen, ameen. and celebrate ameen, and, and enjoy ameen, the, ameen, ameen, the beautiful ameen, land. I mean, Alhamdulillah. And on that, I think we'll conclude this. And to be honest, we can go on and on and on. Uh, but I think time is uh, limited for the live stream and these sorts of things. I've been given 4.30. So inshallah ta'ala, uh, we'll end it there. Uh, one thing I want to highlight uh, in what uh, Dr. Muntos have said was the idea that, you know, um, that support that they feel, the solidarity. This is a battle of wills. It's a battle of spirit. As I said, the Israelis are trying to break the spirit of the Palestinian people. So when people think about, oh, it's not practical, I go there, and then when I go there, it's, you know, what am I actually doing to help the cause? You can feel despondent. You can feel, when you think about things from that angle, well, practically me going there, how is that going to help? But it does help because it gives them strength because that is the actual battleground, is their spirit. And you going there and giving them that support, you uplift them as well with that. Not just the Palestinians that are there, but the Palestinians that are your neighbors, the ones around here as well. They are also part of the struggle as well. We are a global ummah and we support each other in this regard. And like I said, this is unprecedented in the history of this world, in the colonial project. This is the only live and acting battlefront that still exists from the 1920s, subhanAllah, 1940s. This is the only place. Everywhere else, everything status quo. There is no thought of a state in America or in Canada or anything like this that's going to be this at all. The only place where this is reality is Palestine and how fitting a place. Allati barakna hawlahu. The place that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed himself. So do give that support in regards to Visiting, and that's one of the main objectives of this entire event, was actually to encourage people to go and visit. And Amina's presentation showed it's very practical, it's very feasible if you're not Palestinian. And that's the sad thing. You have a bit of survivor's guilt when you get there. And honestly, it breaks my heart whenever I tell Palestinians I went there, because they will all say, you know, I wish I could go there. Even Dr. Mantel sort of there in Palestine can't go to Al-Aqsa. Can't go to Al-Aqsa. And we get to go so easily, subhanAllah. Uh, and they can't go to give the support to the people there, but we can go because we are all one ummah. We are all brothers. We are all one family. We are all kulluna dammana filistin. All of our blood is Philistini blood. And so we are with the, uh, the Palestinian people. And of course, the second thing is du'as. And it sounds like, oh, it's just du'as. No, du'as are a huge part because the du'as are the ones that, think about it like this, on the day of judgment, when the deeds are put in front of you, your du'as, and your wish, if it is for the liberation of the people, and you can do very little other than attend rallies, sign petitions, go to places, spread awareness of, what, of these sorts of things, and you make the dua, then when inshallah, and it will happen, when Palestine is liberated, can you imagine then your duas being a means for the liberation of Palestine, and that being written for you as well. And so duas is a sign of your sincerity. Do you really care about the Palestinian people? If you do, then you'd make dua for the Palestinian people just like you make dua for your family. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free Palestine and liberate it. We'll make a uh, closing dua, bidlahi ta'ala, and then we'll conclude our program. So, I'm so sorry about that. There's a poem. Should we do the dua before, inshallah, or with the poem or after? Khalas, inshallah. We'll go to the poem, bidlahi ta'ala. Sorry about that. <laughs> I forgot about that. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather to advocate for Palestinians. I pay my respect to the elders, past, present, and emerging. As for the Palestinians, sovereignty was never ceded, and treaties have never been signed. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Reflecting on the recent victory of Saudi Arabia over Argentina in the World Cup, we have to ask ourselves, if a victory on a playground defined by four lines can unite the whole Muslim world in celebration and bring so much joy to the heart of the Muslim Ummah, then what would a victory in Philistine mean to this Ummah? The poem I'm going to share was inspired by a young Urdu poet and activist by the name Amir Aziz from India. 
the words of the poem and the meaning it binds and brings together not only shows how the struggles of the oppressed are intertwined, but how the Palestinian cause is at the core of, core of every struggle. The Palestinians are indeed an inspiration for every oppressed people, and for that the entirety of humanity owes you a debt. And I hope these words I recite are regarded as a form of respect, a tribute, a gift from my people, my tradition, my culture, the oppressed people of my nation to the brave Palestinians. The name of the poem is It Will Be Remembered. It will be remembered, all of it will be remembered, our loved ones lost to your butchery, their memories that leave our hearts in misery. With ink, you li your lies are written, beat with our blood, the truth too will be written. It will be remembered, all of it will be remembered. You shut down the streets in the light of day and seal our cities in the cold of night. Bearing hammers, you sneak into our homes, break our heads, our limbs, and snatch our little ones. We will carve the evidence of your abuse onto our bones. It will be remembered, all of it will be remembered. The treacherous ways in which you conspired to steal our lands, as will be remembered the ways we clenched onto it with our hands. When humanity reflects on a time of death and destruction, your actions will be remembered. When humanity reflects on a time of courage and resilience, our names will be remembered. Yes, our names will be remembered, that there were these mortal beings whose will could not be broken by iron hammers, sticks and stones, who smiled in the face of bullets, rifles, missiles and drones. Those who stood tall through the eye of the storm, those who remained alive after the news of their death was known. It will be remembered, all of it will be remembered. The eyes may forget how to blink, the earth forget how to spin. But will be remembered, our flight with tethered wings, our raspy voice, our resistance. You ask for proof of our identity, we will show you the meaning of existence. You write the darkness of the night, we will write the moonlight. Lock us in prisons, we will etch freedom into its walls. Murder us, yes, murder us, we will come back as ghosts to write of your crimes. You write jokes inside courtrooms, we will write justice on the streets outside. It will be remembered, all of it will be remembered. We will speak so loud that even the deaf will hear, write so clear that even the blind will see. Your writings like a black lotus, our writings like the red of roses. You write injustice on these lands, go ahead and write injustice on these lands. It will be remembered, all of it will be remembered. So yeah, keep writing injustice on these lands. We will paint intifada on the skies. Peace and power. Long live Palestine. Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah. Sakhullah khair. Yes, please. We have our sister, uh, Janet Dean, inshallah. Bismillah. One of the descendants from the... In, uh, in 2007, the Muslims of Brisbane uh, donated money to send two containers of medical equipment to Gaza, and from there we started the Muslim Charitable Foundation, starting off in Gaza. SubhanAllah, Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Ukhti, uh, alhamdulillah, thank you so much. Um, you know, subhanAllah, we spoke about the spirit of the Palestinian people. I also want to mention as well, on a more global or practical level, everyone knows, and the Israelis in particular know, how important public opinion is to their entire project. And they know that when people know the truth, that is when the pressure is going to come for that two-state solution and for its Palestinian sovereign land with East Jerusalem at, as, at its, as its capital. Um, so spreading awareness to non-Muslims, because at this point in time, you have the extreme Zionists, you have the Muslims, of course, and then you have the, you know, the knowledgeable ones who are politically savvy, who are on the Palestinian side. Then you have everyone in between. They are not, you know, like 100% with the Zionist project. They just need understanding and education. We actually met a Chinese couple in Canada, actually, and uh, when we were there in, um, uh, in, in Bethlehem. And we started talking to them about what was happening. They had no idea. It's so easy to bring that education because that public opinion shift is one of the most important things. That's the battleground in Australia. That's what we can do here, is do our best to shift the public perception, to educate people what's happening. When I'm at work 
and I say to people, oh, I tell them, especially if you go to Palestine, it's very easy to start this, and it gives you authority as well. You're not just coming out of the blue. Oh, I went to Palestine actually. I went to Jerusalem. This is what I saw. It's really sad what's happening there. Do you know about that? Yeah, this is what happened. This is how the Palestinian people have been treated. It's awful, etc., etc., etc. If the Muslims were to go and whatnot and bring this back, you'd start to see this. And that's another action point that I wanted to mention. Let's just make a, a short dua, inshallah. I know the, the, the day has, has uh, gone long, but alhamdulillah, it's been very beneficial, I hope. Uh, and alhamdulillah, thank you so much, yeah, uh, Dr. Muqtasa, uh, uh, for, for being with us. It's honestly, it was a pleasure. And, uh, you know, inshallah, you'll be around for a bit for people to come and, and inshallah, discuss, absolutely. inshallah. No, That'll be good, because there was not enough there, definitely. No, jazakumullah khair. We're honored to be with you, and we, we thank you so much for all your efforts, inshallah. May Allah reward you in abundance. Alhamdulillah. اللهم لك الحمد كله ولك الشكر كله ولك الحمد إذا رضيت ولك الحمد حتى ترضى ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بك اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيما أعطيت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قديت اللهم انصر المسلمين في كل مكان اللهم انصرهم وارحمهم واعف عنهم يا رب العالمين اللهم كن معكم اللهم كن معهم معينا ونصيرا اللهم انصر المسلمين في الفلسطين اللهم انصر المسلمين في فلسطين اللهم انصر المسلمين في الفلسطين اللهم حر الأقصى من اليهود الظالمين اللهم حر الأقصى اللهم حر الأقصى يا رب العالمين اللهم انصر المسلمين في كل مكان اللهم اللهم انصر المستضعفين في كل مكان اللهم انصرهم في تركستان وفي البرما وفي الهندية وفي اليمن وفي كل مكان يا رب العالمين. Oh Allah, we ask you, oh Allah, mighty of the might. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-Jabbar. We ask Allah al-Azim. We ask Allah al-Aziz. We ask Allah al-Qawi. We ask Allah azza wa jal for a swift victory. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for a swift liberation. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for fathun qareeb. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open the gates and to open the doors of Palestine. We ask Allah to liberate al-Aqsa. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for the Palestinian people. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise up the children of Palestine into a Palestine that they can live and prosper and worship Allah alone. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring rahmah to all the Palestinians around the world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us and enable us to be vehicles of change, to be vehicles of motion. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us the means of the liberation of Palestine. Amin ya alamin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise amongst us and with our next generation, Salahuddin al Ayyubis, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise from amongst us and amongst our generations, Umar al Khattabs, radiallahu anhum ajma'een. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liberate Palestine and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help all the oppressed of the Muslims around the world. This is a time of weakness for us. So we ask Al Qawi for strength in this time and we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to help those in East Turkestan with, uh, with the oppression of the Chinese CCP government. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hit, send his help to the people of Yemen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his help to the people and the Rohingya Muslims of Burma. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help the people of Syria, to help the people all over the world in North Africa, South Africa, in East Turkestan, in the, all the lands of the Muslims, and in India as well, where genocide, subhanAllah, may be imminent. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep the Muslims all around the world safe and to make us a united one ummah and to unite our ranks. Ameen al alameen. Subhanakum bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha anta saghfiru tubu ilaykum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for, for all of us. And I hope inshallah ta'ala we come from here invigorated uh, to support the cause. Uh, and inshallah ta'ala hope to see all your stories and your pictures inshallah ta'ala of Jerusalem. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us all to enter Al-Aqsa. I mean